order, order. And may I welcome our first panel of witnesses in this session looking at the implications of the Supreme Court judgment in the Miller 2 case. Um, we've got a lot of questions to get through and we're looking forward to hearing, very much hearing what you've got to say. Don't feel confined to the question, but um, it, I may need to hurry you along if, we're, if your answer's too long. Um, and um, could I ask each of you to identify yourselves for the record, please? Uh, Richard Deakins, Professor of Law, University of Oxford, Head of Policy Exchanges, Digital Power Project. And Toomey, Professor of Constitutional Law, University of Sydney. Professor Paul Craig, Emeritus Professor, St John's College, Oxford. Well, thank you all for being with us. Um, can I just declare an interest before um, we start the questions, which is that I advised all the leadership candidates against messing around with prorogation. Um, um, and um, um, that advice was obviously ignored, um, though I put myself in the bracket of those who regard maybe what the Supreme Court decided as somewhat inevitable, but as a very significant development in the nature of our judiciary and our constitution, and which is why I was very keen to have this session. Um, so. Starting from the top, <clears throat> Professor Tuomi, I wonder if you could just describe for us, in order to improve our education, um, what is prerogation and why is it necessary? Well, I'm sure the committee is very well aware, um, being parliamentarians, but prerogation ends a session of parliament, allows parliament to commence a new session, and in doing so it um, terminates the sitting of parliament for un until the new session begins. Uh, it ends the actions of parliamentary committees, um, so they can't sit during that period. Um, it clears the notice paper of any notices that have been um, uh, already there, um, any um, sessional orders that might exist, um, orders for production of documents, those sorts of things. So it clears the paper. Uh, it also um, potentially terminates bills that have not um, completed um, passage in both houses. Um, although um, various parliaments have ways of bringing bills back um, with special standing orders, etc. And um, how does it differ from going into recess or a dissolution? Well, dissolution obviously terminates the parliament altogether so that an election can be held. Um, uh, but um, the main distinction, of course, is with um, uh, what in Australia we would more commonly describe as adjournment. Um, so the houses obviously adjourn on a regular basis, um, not always sitting continuously. Um, and um, practice in the United Kingdom has been to adjourn during par party conferences and the like. Um, but during that adjournment, although the Houses themselves don't sit, um, other parliamentary business continues, such as the business of this committee and other um, committees. So scrutiny of government continues. Uh, uh, things on the notice paper, for example, won't be wiped off. Bills can still continue through their process and the like. Um, and what are the relative merits and reasons for prorogation compared to using other mechanisms that we see in other constitutions for ending and beginning legislative sessions such as fixed calendar dates as in the United States? Uh, it's an interesting question because um, from an Australian perspective um, we haven't um, commonly prorogued for some period of time so at the Commonwealth um, level uh, parliament, um, regular parliamentary prorogation ceased around the early 1960s uh, so we would go for a full term of three years without any prorogation. There is actually no need, per se, to end a session and start a new session. Um, part of it here is tradition, so that you have the Queen's speech and the crowns and carriages and all those sorts of things, so people might miss that tradition if you didn't do it. But from a practical parliamentary point of view, the government can always bring in new bills. It's not confined to what it initially um, said in its, its, its first Queen's speech, so that a parliament can continue for a full three years without prorogation. It's not absolutely necessary in any substantive way. Um, it seems to be more of a practice in the United Kingdom to do it annually, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, as you said, another alternative might be doing it on a regular fixed basis. That has some advantages in that uh, people know when parliament's not going to be sitting, so they can plan accordingly. Uh, it would help members of parliament plan when to take their holidays, for example, which is a useful thing to know and be able to plan in advance. 
um, and staff members, um, but it also helps the bureaucracy plan as well in terms of um, knowing when to organise bills so that they can be um, dealt with in a particular time. So there's a lot to be said for um, fixed term um, uh, prorogation and commencement. It would take um, some of the heat out of the use of prorogation for other political purposes. But the downside of it is the lack of flexibility. Uh, so um, from my own point of view, I'm, my general preference is towards flexibility rather than codification uh, because there are exceptional circumstances that arise. It may be appropriate for a session to continue rather than to prorogue because there are particular time sensitive issues where um, Parliament needs to be sitting. So um, I think it depends where you place your emphasis on whether certainty is preferable to um, flexibility and indeed whether <coughs> or not you actually need prorogation at all. Thank you. Eleanor Smith. Comes on to my question, um, is it necessary for pror prorogation to be an executive power? And if so, <coughs> for what reason? Um, I think that's also a really interesting question. It has traditionally been an executive power and so it's been part of this, um, the tension between executive and government and parliament. Uh, but it's always predicated, of course, on the basis that the government is government because it holds the confidence of a majority in the lower house. So to that extent, parliament and government are working in tandem. So when a government that holds the confidence of a majority in the lower house prorogues, um, it's doing so essentially with the support of a majority in the lower house anyway. So there is that, that tension is missing. Uh, it tends to only arise and be an issue when you've got a minority government and you've got a parliament that wants to continue to sit and that's when you have a clash. Uh, one way around the problem, you could leave it as an executive power, but one thing that some other countries do, which might be something that the committee might want to consider, is whether or not you include a mechanism for um, the House to bring itself back into operation early from a prorogation if it sees the need to do so. Um, so for example in some countries there would be a provision that says if an absolute majority of members of the lower House petitioned the Speaker to bring the House back to sit, uh, then in those circumstances the Speaker can do so. Now, if you had that kind of thing, it sort of wouldn't then matter if the executive was proroguing um, for um, any kind of political or improper reason, because the House itself would always have an ability to bring itself back if a majority so considered it necessary. Um, and that balances, in some ways, the ability of, part of government, on the one hand, to have the ability to prorogue when it sees it necessary or important to do so because of its management as government of the parliamentary agenda. But also, if you've got a majority, or an absolute majority, so 50% plus one, in the House of Commons that wanted to bring the parliament back, uh, then that would give it the freedom to do so. It would also mean that the courts then had no real role in the um, issue at all because from a court's point of view it would be impossible to say that you were frustrating the ability of the House to sit if the House always had the ability by majority to bring itself back to sit. Um, so that's one type of option that the committee might want to consider. But it's just worth reminding ourselves that so many unusual circumstances exist in the present political situation. We don't usually run with minority governments. We've never run with a minority government where the operation of fixed term parliament has been frustrating a general election. Um, so we have some very unusual ingredients in the present situation. Um, uh, would the other witnesses like to come in on Eleanor Smith's question? Uh, maybe just a little bit to, to pick up on something that Professor Twomey said, that um, it is a power to control parliamentary time. It's part related to the government's responsibility for the parliamentary agenda. Uh, so political considerations are always going to be significant there. Uh, some of those political considerations will be perfectly reasonable and sometimes even uncontroversial. Sometimes they'll be highly controversial when numbers are uh, tricky. Um, I think there's there's a sense in our tradition, our history, for this to be a crown power, obviously exercised by a government with the confidence of the House of Commons and the trouble one gets into with the controversy is if that confidence looks like it's um, uh, um, in abeyance or might be withdrawn, uh, which is many of the controversies that arise concern precisely when um, uh, the question is whether a prorogation is being used to avoid confidence. And that's the really, this is the, the burningly problematic instance. Otherwise there's a sort of range of uh, 
situations in which prorogation might be justifiable, but there'll be an a understandable political controversy at times. Could I just add um, a further thought on this? Uh, just to, I don't want to repeat what Professor Tomey has said, she's covered the ground extremely well, um, and I don't necessarily disagree with what Professor Eakin said in this respect. The only point I would make in addition to what has been said in relation to these first few questions about the relative merits of prorogation uh, as opposed to other methods of ending the session and whether this needs to be an executive power. The only point I would make in this respect is as follows. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm of the mind that if it, isn't broke, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And the normal methods in which we prorogue Parliament and the normal practice of prorogation seems to be, in relative terms, unexceptionable save for this very important qualification. It has become apparent that certain members of the present executive feel that it's legitimate to prorogue parliament in order to ensure that a recalcitrant parliament does not impede the executive in attaining objectives which the, the executive believes to be justified. Now, that, to my view, in 40 years as a constitutional lawyer, is an entire novelty. Um, and I think that if that belief were to be shared, then I think it would be deeply problematic for our constitutional order. But equally, if that belief is not shared, then I think it is something which ought to be clarified, and I don't think that the issue should just be left, as it were, to lie on the table in terms of the future, no matter how exceptional the present circumstances might be. Thank you very much, and that leads straight to Dame Cheryl Dillon's question. Yes, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, the chairman and I were, were both here in 1997, um, when uh, the then Prime Minister John Major uh, prorogued. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to you, Professor Tamey, because it was in your book you highlighted that there had been few instances of prorogation being used by governments for, for um, a range of controversial political purposes um, in parliamentary systems, both at national and, and federal level, um, I presume. Um, in your view, what have been the limits uh, to the use of prorogation? Depends on what you mean by the limits, whether you mean legal limits or political limits. I mean, um, obviously... I think both in this instance, mm. because we're exploring... When I've looked at this, I've looked at this in the context of the reserve powers. So at what point might the monarch or a vice-regal officer interfere or intervene if prorogation is being used <coughs> inappropriately? And that's always at the very extreme end. So that's going to be in circumstances where uh, you're breaching a, a, a fundamental constitutional principle like the principles of responsible government, or the, as the Supreme Court described it, um, parliamentary accountability. Uh, so in those sort of circumstances, as we saw um, in, like the Harper government um, when it sought to prorogue in Canada in 2008, um, the Governor-General considered, and I understand she considered she had a reserve power to refuse to prorogue, but in those particular circumstances where it looked like the um, coalition of opposition was not going to be sustainable. Uh, she thought that a prorogation for a short period of time was appropriate and she prorogued anyway. But the general view taken in Canada was that that was a limit, that there was at least a discretion on the part of the Governor-General to refuse to prorogue in those circumstances. Um, similarly, in um, circumstance cases in Tasmania, um, Western Australia and um, some other jurisdictions, uh, where prorogation has been used for the purposes of sustaining a government that appears to have likely lost confidence, uh, then those are circumstances for refusing it. The other sorts of circumstances where it might be used in a way that is politically inappropriate um, wouldn't necessarily be sufficiently serious to um, reject the advice of government. So politically inappropriate uses would be trying to stop a parliamentary committee from inquiring into something that's very embarrassing to the government prior to an election. That's happened quite a bit in Australia. Um, and indeed, the, um, allegedly, the John Major incident. Um, uh, 
one circumstance was um, ending a, a pairing agreement so that a government could push um, a controversial bill through Parliament um, by having got rid of the pairing agreement that had only been made for the previous session. Again, that's pretty inappropriate. Uh, in some countries where you have a rule that says that you're disqualified if you don't attend two sessions of Parliament, um, without the agreement of um, the presiding officers, if you had a couple of very quick prorogations in order to disqualify people, that would also be very inappropriate. Uh, whether or not it would be grounds for the um, a vice regal representative or the Queen to refuse to reject it, to refuse advice would be controversial, um, difficult to see. Now we've got this extra factor coming in of the Supreme Court saying, well, um, we're going to look at what the actual scope of the power to prorogue is. Um, that adds an extra dimension now that we need to look potentially at legal limits on the power as well as um, these sorts of political circumstances in which it might be inappropriate to use. I mean, that really was my next question. What are, what, what are the implications of the Supreme Court judgment now on, on the limits? Um, and, and the future use of our prorogation powers here, particularly on, on political basis. But Professor Ethans. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I think the Supreme Court's judgment creates uh, a, a novel legal limit that's unknown in our history and in wider common law practice. I and mean, there are legal limits could be established by Act of Parliament, and there are some requiring sittings of Parliament. But otherwise, the power of prorogue is not in our history, our constitution, subject to legal limits. The Supreme Court's judgment uh, creates legal limit and, and applies it, uh, although doing its best, I think, to make it clear or to try to suggest it's not a novel creation. But I think it clearly is. It's made new law in that judgment. And that, I think, has the effect of displacing the political controls that are otherwise the most significant restraint on abuse of the power to prorogue. I, mean, I agree that there's um, likely reserved power in some cases for Her Majesty to refuse advice to prorogue, and it would be unconstitutional to prorogue in an attempt to uh, to govern without the confidence of the Houses of Parliament. Uh, but the main control on uh, abuse of the power to prorogue has been political and practical. That's extremely hard to govern, to do anything new at least, without uh, regular sessions of Parliament. <coughs> uh, and I think the, the Court expressly says that that's scant reassurance and it, it creates a new limit, um, which I think is highly problematic and certainly something new that needs to be considered. Professor Craig. Uh, I take a different view to Professor Eakins. <coughs> of course, in a reductionist sense, the Supreme Court decision creates new law in the sense that we hadn't had a decision concerning prorogation prior to the Miller II decision. But that is reductionist in the following sense. Courts only decide cases when someone brings a case to them. Now. Uh, and when the circumstances arise from which such a case would be brought. So the idea that somehow the principles being elucidated in Miller II are novel in the sense that they were created by the Supreme Court and had not existed hitherto, I do not think would stand examination. I think that those principles actually flow from prior case law as the Supreme Court itself said, and they flow from the application of constitutional principle, as the Supreme Court explained. Now, I don't think that the Supreme Court in any sense regards the judgment as overturning methods of political accountability. It sees it as supplementing or complementing political accountability in the manner which the court elaborated in the judgment which it gave. Um, could I just add to that? Mm. Um, I think, um, and just putting on my hat as a former government legal officer, so if I were advising a Prime Minister or a Premier in relation to prorogation, which indeed I have in the past in New South Wales, um, after this decision what I'd be advising them to do would be to be first of all careful when you decide to prorogue. If you're going to prorogue for more than a relatively short period of time, one week, two weeks, if you're going anything further than that, then you have to have some kind of a justifiable reason. And so you need to think about it and work out, well, what kind of reasonable justification can you give? And can you show that you're doing it for a purpose other than simply to shut down and avoid parliamentary scrutiny or parliamentary action um, in relation to legislation? So you need to be able to marshal those arguments. And if you can't marshal them, then you shouldn't be doing it. Um, and you know, from a practical point of view, again, if I was a legal advisor, even without a Supreme Court decision, um, I would be arguing, advising government, well, then you shouldn't be 
um, proroguing for purposes of simply shutting down parliament, particularly if you don't have a, the, um, the support of a majority in parliament, because that is consistent with constitutional principle. But from a practical point of view, if you're a Premier or a Prime Minister now um, in the United Kingdom, you would certainly want to be careful before you prorogue to make sure that you had marshalled all the relevant arguments and you had evidence that you could use to show to a court if it was challenged. Uh, Professor Kitch? Oh, well, you, now, you now face legal risk in proroguing, which you didn't face before. And you have to persuade a court that you have good enough reason in the court's eyes to prorogue. Is this justification acceptable in the eyes of the court? That is a new thing in our arrangements, and I think it's problematic. And I think it does displace political accountability. It's a sense, obviously, in which you can be politically criticised and uh, taken to court by your political opponents. But political opponents of a prorogation will predictably and understandably recall, take recourse to the courts. Uh, you can say this hasn't happened before, which is true, partly because it was unthinkable. Uh, and the divisional court's judgment in that first instance, dismissing the application, I think was, in my judgment, that this is a clear right uh, outcome one would otherwise have expected if uh, the law had not been changed in a, in a law-making act. Can I just ask uh, two very brief supplementaries? One is, what, what do we think the court would have decided if the prorogation had been four days shorter? Four days shorter. Yes, I don't think that. I think that, with respect, the whole emphasis in the government's arguments on the precise number of days of the prorogation was actually a red herring, and it was not the basis on which the court decided it, and it was not the basis on which the court reasoned the decision either in the Supreme Court or in the Court of Session in Scotland. What the court did in Miller II when it applied its test was to do something which is absolutely unexceptional in a liberal democracy, which is to say it is open to the government to come to the court and make any argument that it so wishes to justify its actions. The government came to the court and said, said to the court, we are proroguing parliament for five weeks in order to pave the way for a new legislative session. The court simply did what courts do, which is to ask the government, what is the connection between the need for a prorogation of five weeks and the beginning of a new legislative session? The cupboard was entirely bare. The government had all the time in the world to produce documentary evidence for any causal connection between the two propositions. It provided none because there was none, none that, the, none that they put forward. Now, for a court in a liberal democracy to merely accept the word, the say-so, of the government without evidentiary foundation seems to me not in accord with our constitutional traditions. Um, Professor Rickett? I, I would have said the court should have said this was not a question for us to answer. Uh, therefore, uh, we don't have to have an explanation for the Which government. Which is what the divisional courts Indeed, yeah. indeed. As to your question about four days, I think it's hard to say because the court's conclusion, I think the sort of central proposition is that this prorogation had an extreme effect on the fundamentals of our democracy. I think that's a political judgment. Uh, if you reduce the number of days, they may have been less likely to reach that conclusion. But I'm speculating, I don't know. Um, and my second supplementary is um, during the period in which Parliament sat, from uh, during early September, um, Parliament sat in the full knowledge that Parliament was going to be prorogued in the week commencing the 9th. And Parliament declined to express an opinion. Parliament did not take any action uh, to prevent it. Parliament allowed the government to continue in office. Um, to what extent do, do we think the court, in fact, um, has taken over the role of Parliament because of Parliament's failure to act in its own interests? Well, to start with, Parliament did act earlier, so it, it, it acted in the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act, um, and that um, was an act to force um, Parliament to come back from prorogation if prorogation occurred on it particular was an indirect days. Moment, wasn't it? <coughs> and, and that in itself um, affected the government's prorogation dates, because um, otherwise if the government had, as it might have otherwise done, and we don't know, but if it, if it had otherwise decided to prorogue for the whole of um, September um, and October up until the dates of 31st of October, which 
was something that some people had suggested. Um, it would have been forced by the, that particular act to come back and to sit for five day periods. Um, and so that was factored into the relevant dates that the, the prorogation covered so that you had the dates of sitting in September and you had the dates of sitting in October to reflect um, that. So Parliament had exercised its power to some extent. I guess then the question is, well, when it did come back and sit in early September, should it have taken further action if it didn't want to be prorogued? Um, members of Parliament will know better than I in relation to this, but I suspect that from a timing point of view, um, the focus was really on the other piece of legislation that they wanted to enact, the, the Ben Act, um, rather than attempting to get agreement on um, uh, some sort of law in relation to prorogation, and that's where they um, place their emphasis. Um, should the court have taken this into account um, in relation to um, its decision? I think that's a hard question, um, partly because the Scottish proceedings actually commenced uh, before that period of parliamentary sitting. So there is a question as to, you know, at what point um, do you um, make your decision about the appropriateness of prorogation? Do you have to take into account something that's been happen that's happened after the decision to prorogue was made, um, which the government didn't know about at that time because it made its decision to prorogue, leaving Parliament to sit for a certain period of time first, should the courts take that into account or not? And I think that's a very difficult area. I don't know what the answer to that should be. Oh, Professor Craig. Um, thank you very much. I very much take the point of your question. Um, my response is as follows. My response rather tracks that of the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court only dealt with this briefly, so let me just amplify the proposition. It is, of course, the case that if Parliament chooses at some stage to pass legislation dealing with prorogation, then that will become the foundation for a, any power or duty relating to uh, prorogation and would be duly taken account of by the courts in subsequent litigation. The courts cannot, however, forestall or abjure proper scrutiny of executive action on the ground that some form of parliamentary or political form of accountability might have occurred or might take place. The very statement of that proposition reveals its inadequacy. That would be an impossible standard for the court to work to. It would also mean, if we took that proposition seriously, that a number of key legal judgments were wrong. So, for example, seminal decision of the House of Lords in the GCHQ case, which said that the manner of exercise of prerogative power was reviewable by the court, subject to issues about justiciability, which I'm sure we'll come on to. But that basic proposition would be, per incuriam, it would be wrongly decided if we were to say that the court should never review the exercise of prerogative power until or unless the executive or political branch of government had had some chance of controlling that power. Because the problem with that proposition is that you could always say, well, you, the court, should never review this exercise of prerogative power, because it would always be open to the political branch of government either to pass legislation or to take some action which might in some way structure or confine that discretion. Um, Professor Eakins? I, I would say the law of the land, until the Supreme Court's judgment, was that there are no legal controls on prorogation. The controls are political and practical, perhaps constitutional, by way of the Queen and extremists. Uh, so it's highly relevant that there's a capacity for the House of the Parliament um, and the House of Commons in particular to uh, answer uh, misuse or perceived misuse. It's especially relevant as an opportunity to do so in advance of the action by withdrawing confidence or by otherwise bringing about an early election. Uh, it's certainly true that Parliament can legislate to impose legal controls. Um, Parliament in the Fixed Term Parliament Act uh, chose not to uh, undercut um, the power, the prerogative power to prorogue. But, Professor Tommy's mentioned the, uh, the July legislation, the Northern Ireland Act. In a sense, I think that's Parliament legislating about prorogation in the autumn. It's a code for uh, the consequences of proroguing, uh, bringing it short in certain circumstances. I think it is extraordinary that the court superimposes a novel legal constraint on top of 
uh, which goes beyond that which Parliament enacted in July this year with a view to this particular period of time. I think that is um, strong. <coughs> I mean, we were we were all brought up on the sort of the sanctity of the separation of powers, um, which which seems to be being challenged here. Do you see this as a, a step on the road towards the American system? Uh, well, the American system has uh, is a particularly strange and, and odd one. Um, yes. Obviously, the courts are very politically significant. Uh, I think it's a, it's a step towards the courts viewing themselves as the guardian of the constitution, rather than as having a particular responsibility for settled law. And I think that's what one sees in the judgment is, uh, in, in a way, running quite contrary to their Miller No. 1 judgment, where uh, they recognise that convention is not for courts to enforce. And they were quite right to say that. Courts are neither the parents nor the guardians of constitutional convention, they say. It doesn't look like they hold to that position any longer, at least as I read how the judgment is uh, rationalised. It looks to me like uh, a, a, a judgment on the part of the court that the political controls are inadequate, uh, that whether in this case or some, some worse case the political controls could not be relied upon, the court will insert itself into the process here. So I think it's part of a judicialisation of politics and lately a politicisation of, of the, the judicial process, by which I don't mean that the courts were biased, I simply mean that they are making a judgment on the basis of political considerations that are not for them to decide. Yes, I would like to emphasise any comments we make on absolutely no, not intended to impugn the integrity of the court as an institution or the, or the individuals who serve on the court. Professor Craig. Um, not you won't be surprised to hear that I do not agree with <laughs> Professor Eakins in any of those respects. Firstly, firstly, we had no authority whatsoever for the proposition that prorogation was completely non-justiciable and out with the power of the courts. We had no authority for that proposition at all. What we had, the only thing we had, was a statement in a case in a House of Lords decision that dissolution, which is not prorogation, was non-justiciable. Now, it's not even clear that that would still be regarded as true today, but that to some extent that's been overtaken by the Fixed Term Parliament Act. But we had no authority whatsoever for the proposition that prorogation was untouchable by the courts or wholly non-justiciable. Uh, non Secondly, I think we are losing sight of the wood for the trees. The standard formula in relation to prerogative power has always been courts de uh, determine the existence of such power, the limits of such power, and prima facie the manner of exercise subject to any concerns about justiciability. That is the law. That is not new creation. That has been the law since the 17th century as built upon by later case law. So the idea that the court is creating some massively new control here simply does not withstand examination. And of course, part of the reason why we believe that discretionary power exercised by the executive pursuant to the prerogative should be controlled is that we exercise and take it as fundamental that we should exercise discretionary power when the executive exercise it, exercises it pursuant to statute. So the whole driving rationale of the courts has been you, the executive, should not gain some special advantage merely because you happen to be exercising discretionary power pursuant to a prerogative power. Indeed, in many ways, the argument could be taken the other way around. Legislation has the imprimatur, has the approval of go having gone through the processes of Parliament. Parliament has considered it and has decided to accord a particular discretionary power to a minister, a government agency, or local authority. Prerogative power, by way of contrast, has no such imprimatur. It is his there for historical reasons, and I am not gainsaying it. I'm merely pointing out that the driving force behind the courts has been to ensure that executive discretionary power, which happens fortuitously to be organized and uh, run through the, the prerogative, is subject to the same controls as statutory discretionary power. This is not new, and it's not novel, and it's not unconstitutional. Um, I need to bring in one or two supplementaries. Yeah. Just, just briefly, briefly um, 
there's an interesting difference of view <laughs> amongst our witnesses, which is uh, I'm pleased to see. Um, but Professor Ekin is suggesting that there's a fundamental constitutional change has really taken place. Um, can I ask, if uh, the Supreme Court had never been established, and I, for one, was very uneasy about its establishment, would the law lords have taken such a decision? Because they were the, the highest part of our, our legal system. Uh, I think it's hard to say, um, because it's 10 years of, of development. And obviously, I mean, Lady Hale, President of the Court, was uh, one of the law lords. It's a continuity of personnel. Uh, it's hard to know how far the creation of a distinct institution with its um, the paraphernalia and the term supreme changes the thinking. I've always tended to view that it doesn't much. Maybe <coughs> I'm wrong about that. Uh, I think it's, it is significant that the court, as I see it, is understanding itself to be in a position, at least in this case, as the guardian of the constitution, having a role, as I see it again, of developing the law, changing the law in order to supplement and uh, replace parts of the political constitution. It may be that a committee of the House of Lords would have been less likely to view itself as having that position within the Constitution, simply because it would have been obvious to it that it was not solely, uh, or didn't have, didn't have an overarching responsibility for the, the health of the Constitution. I mean, I think the, the court and the courts traditionally have had clearly a responsibility for the law, not a responsibility for making new law to uh, compensate for perceived defects in the political process. So I think it may have made a difference, but it's very hard to say. Can I just um, add something? I think I've been um, physically placed between um, the, the people on both sides um, because my position is somewhat in the, in the middle of the two of them. So um, uh, let me just put the middle of the road position and that is, um, uh, yes, um, uh, it, when it comes to separation of powers, uh, separation of powers is not just about the judiciary exercising judicial power, legislature executive ex executing legislative power and executive exercising executive power. It's also about checks and balances. Um, so it's about the various parts checking each other. Um, so one part of that is that the judges, through the exercise of judicial power, um, ensure that the rule of law is obeyed. Um, and that includes determining the extent of the power in relation to the prerogative. And it also includes that the executive power, um, when it is exercised, is executed in a way that is consistent with the requirements of law, such as procedural fairness, etc., etc. So from that point of view, it's not a breach of separation of powers at all. However, on the other side, where I think things have moved a little bit, um, and that is that this notion of the guardian of the constitution was previously um, one attached to the monarch. Um, so it was um, previously expected that if the political system went astray, if people moved outside the conventions, if they moved outside the constitutional principle, it was the monarch um, who would act. And I think what's really happening here is that there's been a shift from the role of the monarch to the courts. Um, uh, now, I'm not quite clear exactly why or how that's happening. I think one of the real problems in all of this is that um, the, the secrecy rules concerning the monarch and what the monarch does means that we have very little information as to how the monarch sees her constitutional role and whether she is exercising it behind the scenes, as indeed one ordinarily would through advising and warning and those sorts of things. It may well be that the Queen did take such action in relation to prorogation, royal assent, all sorts of other things. We cannot know. But I think in the absence of that knowledge, what's happening is that the courts are beginning to fulfil a role so that <coughs> it allows the Queen not to. So when it comes to reserve powers, if there are issues in relation to legality and constitutionality, um, the Queen does not need to act if the matter is justiciable and it can be determined by a court. And so what the court is doing is fulfilling that role by making it justiciable, means the Queen has no obligation to act and fulfil the role, and therefore the court might be seeing that it's doing this as a way of protecting the Queen from having to behave in a way that may be seen as controversial. So from the bigger political um, question, I think that that's the real <coughs> shift that's happening there. Um, uh, whether or not that's okay. an appropriate shift is another matter. Um, this is all incredibly interesting but we are taking much too long. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if we can shorten our interventions and um, uh, have shorter answers, uh, I'd be very, very grateful if you can make it crisper and quicker. Uh, you can always submit something in writing afterwards if you feel that there's something been left unsaid. Mr Jones, briefly. 
<laughs> and, uh, I haven't opened my mouth so far, Chairman. <laughs> uh, as uh, Professor Craig predicted, we move to the issue of uh, justiciability. And of course, one of the central issues that was considered by the Supreme Court in its judgment was the question of whether the exercise of the power to prorogue was justiciable. Could you outline briefly how the court dealt with that? Uh, and also, perhaps each of you could give your views as to the implications of that. Indeed, thank you very much. The way in which the Supreme Court approached the matter was in two stages. First of all, it made clear that the mere fact that an issue has a political dimension does not render it non-justiciable. Secondly, the way in which it approached the prerogative was to say that the court was dealing with the case in terms of defining the limits of this particular prerogative power of prorogation. And the that was important in conceptual terms because the court, it has been accepted that courts can define the limits of prerogative power ever since the 17th century. And it defined those limits through two constitutional principles, one being parliamentary sovereignty, one being parliamentary accountability. Uh, and then it applied the limits as it had defined them to the facts of the case. Now I understand the need for brevity because of exigencies of time, so let me merely make the following um, two very brief points. One, if one <coughs> believes that the issue should have been regarded as wholly non-justiciable, then two consequences inexorably follow. One consequence is that it would have been open to the government to go to court and simply say nothing and provide no reason at all for its behavior on the ground that its behavior was simply non-justiciable and not open to judicial scrutiny at all. Or alternatively, to have gone to the court and said to the court, perhaps um, uh, it might have done this, it would have said to the court, we are proroguing Parliament because we believe that we wish to get a deal or no deal done by Halloween and that this is the best way to achieve it by removing a recalcitrant Parliament. Now, if you believe or if one believes that prorogation is wholly non-justiciable, it would have been open to the government to make that argument to the court and there would have been no legal redress. That's the first consequence. The second consequence is that if you believe that prorogation is indeed wholly non-justiciable, then what it means going forward, and certainly not going backwards, but going forward, what it means is that Parliament remains sovereign, it has no boundaries, procedural or substantive, to its omnipotence. However, it sits at the grace and favour of the executive and that grace and favour and that executive discretionary power is wholly uncontrollable outside the walls of Westminster. Now that would be a new constitutional proposition. There is no authority that Parliament's sovereignty has been bounded in that way. There is no case, there is no text and there is no article or essay in the voluminous literature on sovereignty which attests to limits of that kind. So I believe that the court was right to find that it was justiciable and I believe that its application in the circumstances of the case was correct as well. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, I'll just do the, the middle bit then, um, uh, which is because I know what um, Professor Eakins is going to say. Um, uh, but, um, so just to, to be um, brief then, what I think is the interesting part out of the decision is not the, the fact that they said that you know, we're the court and we can decide the extent of the power. Um, it's always had the power to do that and that's uncontroversial. Um, what is controversial though is the extent is the way that they did that and whether that trespasses into other areas, which I'm no doubt Professor Eakins will look at. Um, what I think is interesting from it, however, is um, that it did leave open um, uh, the issue of whether or not 
you could um, deal with this under administrative law mechanisms such as improper purpose. Now, the court very cleverly, I think, in this particular case, avoided all that, saying it was just going to look at the scope of the power, and because it fell on that basis, it didn't need to go to the other side. Um, I think what will be interesting is to see whether in future the court does, so it leaves open um, the expansion of this into areas of justiciability. Um, this traces back to the CCSU case, um, 1985. Um, I would accept that prorogation did fall into the same category as um, uh, dissolution, uh, being those areas that were regarded as non-justiciable in terms of subject matter. But since then, we've had many developments in the court where those areas previously described as non-justiciable, like uh, the prerogative of mercy, for example, have in subsequent cases been looked at with, in relation to not the discretion involved in the granting of mercy, but the means by which it is done, whether it is done for an improper purpose, etc. And I suspect that that kind of reasoning might trickle through in the future. So that's something to look at. Uh, I'll be brief as I can. Um, so I mean, the court says it's, it's looking at scope and existence and not at the manner of exercise. And then its account of scope and existence takes over the manner of exercise. Uh, it turns out, uh, as the, court, um, uh, the court's judgment makes it the case uh, as a matter of law, that the scope of the power to prorogue is uh, a power to prorogue only so long as one does not uh, interfere with constitutional principles, uh, which the court notes. Um, and so long as one does not prorogue uh, for too long in a way that the court does not think has an adequate justification. So I think, I think there's a real problem there of collapsing uh, the two, the, the, dis the distinction the court's drawing to justify uh, intruding in this matter, uh, to say, to uh, get around the, the divisional court's judgment on justiciability. The distinction they draw, I think, collapses. And I think that's a serious problem. Uh, they call an aid to constitutional principles, um, and uh, Professor Craig spoken about one of them, parliamentary sovereignty. I think the, the court adopts, for the purposes of its argument, a, a very surprising and uh, novel account of parliamentary sovereignty. That uh, and the divisional court said it's the same account. This is we'll, a, we'll, we will come to this subject later. Okay, oh, forgive me. Uh, uh, well, let me just, on, on Professor Craig's two implications. I think it would have been open to the government, or should have been under the law, open to the government, simply to provide no reason to the court and there to be no legal recourse. Of course, the, the government's got to provide an account to the Houses of Parliament and to the public. Uh, it doesn't have to provide it to the court. And I don't think the uh, ability to prorogue makes it the case that parliamentary sovereignty is somehow uh, an illusion or has always had this, this hidden qualification. Parliament's still sovereign, and well, parliamentary sovereignty is not in violation when Parliament is dissolved or in recess or in a, during prorogation. Um, just on, uh, uh, Professor Craig, you said that the um, government could have made the case that prorogation was in the national interest because of the need to negotiate with the European Union. But wasn't the court under an obligation to consider that anyway? Why did the government need to make that case? Because it was quite obvious. Courts, the, the, the court certainly did not address that question. I agree, but then courts address arguments which are put to them. And it was open to the government to put any argument that it wished. And to my knowledge, that argument was not put in terms to the no, court. But my point isn't the uh, court under an obligation. I mean, it considered a lot of things that were not put to it um, uh, in this judgment. No, I, with respect, I do not think that's so. The fact that courts sometimes, <coughs> on some occasions, consider matters of their own volition does not, with respect, translate into a general obligation on courts to put arguments which litigants should be putting themselves if they wish to do okay. so. Thank you. Marcus Fish. Uh, thanks. Um, just uh, following the judgment, um, uh, you know, how is a person exercising the prerogative power supposed to uh, make a judgment as to um, uh, what uh, what a reasonable justification might be, um, especially when you have, you know, terms mentioned in the judgment such as extreme effect on the fundamentals of democracy. Um, I'm just interested in your view as to that. It would seem to be pretty unclear to me what, whatever evidence might have been marshalled for a particular point of view in the end how on earth can they judge whether that's sufficient? Well, I think what you have to do is to give a reason 
um, above and beyond just wanting to stop Parliament from um, exercising its legislative or its scrutiny powers. Um, so, for example, um, in Tasmania, um, when there was an attempt uh, to prorogue for a long period when it looked like the government might have um, lost confidence, um, this is an issue about the um, very controversial issue about building a dam in Tasmania, um, which was opposed by environmentalists. And um, uh, in that particular case, the advice, we've, we've seen a copy of the advice, the advice to the governor. Um, gave reasons about why they needed to prorogue for this period of time. And they said, well, we need to prorogue for a period of time to consider the results of a, a referendum that had been held um, uh, and to address certain policy issues um, and you know, to deal with certain um, financial issues, and that's why we're proroguing. Um, and even in those circumstances, the governor negotiated them down to a smaller period of time for prorogation. So if you have good justifications, you, know, you have a budgetary measure that needs to be dealt with at a particular time, or you um, have to um, consider certain policy ramifications from an event, um, then that's fine. If your only reason for proroguing is because you can't control the parliament and you don't want it to act against your will, that's going to be the, the problematic one because that's going to be the one that breaches constitutional principle. But if you can find proper reasons that aren't that, then you're probably okay. Uh, What's your opinion, Professor Eakins? So I, I think, I mean, said before in a way, but in a way, Prime Ministers going forward will have good reason to be uh, very cautious in the use of the power to prorogue. So, uh, be very um, reluctant to use the power in controversial contexts. And that might not be the end of the world. It might be um, uh, a good state of affairs if, if the power is not used in provocative or controversial ways. Uh, I'd rather if that were the state of affairs that came about because Parliament had decided that there should be limits on, on the power rather than the shadow of, of legal risk. But I think there will be a shadow of legal risk. And there are, I mean, I think Professor Twomey's book traces it, uh, contexts in which, in which we see across the common law world and, and history where Power, use of the power to prorogue is controversial, may well be constitutional, might be justified, but that's a matter of political controversy. Now, I think you're going to have to uh, you'd be well advised to um, be very slow, unless you want to risk a legal battle, and maybe that's sometimes um, a calculation is made. Anything to add to that? Or, or, or I, um, I didn't have very much to add to it at all. Um, I agree um, very much with. Professor Toomey's general account of how this operates. I mean, the only thing I would add is the following. I think the idea that the court is going to be, as it were, jumping in um, right, left, and centre to control the exercise of, prerogative, uh, of the power of prorogation is, I think, wholly mistaken. The court made very clear, explicitly in its judgment, that its review would take into account fully the, circuit, the Prime Minister's discretion, the need to balance, need, the need that the Prime Minister has to balance a whole set of conflicting variables about when and whether prorogation takes place. So I think Professor Twomey has it exactly right in the sense of if the Prime Minister or the government's legal representatives, if there is a legal action, comes to court and said, we did it for reasons X, Y, and Z, and they make prima facie sense, then I don't think that the court's going to interfere. Um, so the idea that we are get, uh, we're having a court which is jumping in and um, re-calibrating re, uh, our political order in all circumstances is not the consequence of this judgment. Um, yeah, one of the traditional prerogative powers, the one of dissolution, went with the Fixed Term Parliament Act. And I think there was an attempt to put it in there, there was an amendment, but the government said that the conventions are strong enough. And now we've seen what's happened since. Um, is there any guidance from the judgment about this? I don't think there's any guide. I mean, in terms of... About the, the strength court. of the conventions that we don't need it. Well, I, I mean, I don't think that the court, that the court um, uh, makes clear at a number of points that it's open to Parliament to legislate about prorogation if it wishes, and, and in the same way it's open, in the same way as it has done, about the length of sittings of Parliament. And Parliament has legislated about those matters since the 18th century onwards. So it makes clear that. I think that in relation 
to, I don't think it's, it deals as such or sees it as the court trespassing on a constitutional convention. What you have is a power in terms of prorogation which is normally wholly unexceptionable. The reason why it created a problem in this instance and the reason why the case ended up in court is that the power was used in a way which was not normal. It was very abnormal and there seemed to be a disjunction between the reason which was given for its usage and the actual reality of what was going on. That was why the court was involved, but I don't think that the court regarded itself as trespassing on a constitutional convention or turning a constitutional convention into law. Um, the court does refer to practical restraints on the misuse of the powers bureau. It says that those offer scant reassurance. And to me, that reads like more has to be done by, and the court will make it so that the, the law fills the void. Uh, I mean, the court does, I should add, refer to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty there, but in doing so, it says that power to must be subject to legal restraint and then recites some acts of parliament which impose some legal restraint. No quarrel from me. If an act of parliament imposes restraint, uh, no problem. Uh, an act of parliament, as we've talked about already, did impose restraints for the autumn. That was the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act. What the court does is to add on further restraints on top. Uh, now, I think it, um, the as I've said before, the, I think the heart of the court's judgment is this idea that the, this prorogation had an extreme effect on the fundamentals of our democracy. Uh, and that's a political evaluation and characterisation, a uh, contestable one. And uh, I think it, it begs the question, rather, this was an obviously unconstitutional prorogation. Certainly an unusual one, certainly a politically extremely controversial one. Uh, but well, I can see through the common law practice elsewhere, much more, uh, much lengthier uh, prorogations. Um, uh, and prorogations in contexts where confidence is more in doubt. I'd say if there's a constitutional restriction on prorogation, it would be don't misuse it to remain in office when you don't have the confidence of the Commons. And that wasn't the case here, uh, as I see it, um, especially given the, the point of time left before prorogation came into force. So it might be political controversial, it might be imprudent and wrong, uh, but I don't think it's the responsibility of the courts to uh, evaluate that or to give an answer to the question should this have been done that doesn't turn on uh, an act of parliament imposes a limit. Um, I just want to add from an international perspective, the, the view has always been taken that um, convention is very, very strong in the United Kingdom and that's one of the strengths of its constitution. Here, something is unconstitutional if you are breaching convention, um, whereas in Australia or other countries with written constitution, it's unconstitutional if you're actually breaching the terms of a written um, constitution. Um, the problem with this entire um, situation is that conventions basically been thrown under the Brexit bus um, and that's actually really bad from an international point of view there are lots of other countries in the world if, if the Supreme Court hadn't ruled as it had there would be lots of other countries particularly in the South Pacific in the Caribbean where you had leaders who'd lost confidence but wanted to keep going on and, and running Parliament without confidence you'd just be saying well happen in the United Kingdom, you can prorogue for a long period of time, and by the way, it's non-justiciable, the court can't deal with it. I'm gonna sit here for a, you know, a year governing until such time as my supply runs out and um, uh, no one can stop me. Um, from that point of view, the, US, the UK Supreme Court's decision was actually really useful in terms of an example to um, other countries who use this system. Um, but um, I'm hoping um, that after the Brexit controversy is over, the United Kingdom moves back to its position of being very strong on convention because it's a good example to the rest of the Westminster world. Yeah, I know the chair said that he advised against. There's a letter doing the rounds on Twitter that Matt Hancock wrote saying exactly the same thing, that we shouldn't do this. It will send a terrible uh, Indeed, it does. message yes. to the rest of the world about what a tin pot dictatorship, and now it's happened. Um, would you favour some sort of clarity with these rules and practices for prorogation in particular? Um, being codified, uh, enshrined in an act of parliament, because at the moment, yeah, the convention is obviously not strong enough if the courts have to step in with this government with a ma very majoritarian mindset. Mm. It has Look, no majority. I have to say my prejudice has always been against codification. One of the problems is once you codify things and or put them into statute, then you can have circumstances arise that you haven't predicted, uh, which um, aren't able to be dealt with properly by the statute and the rules that you're in. So constitutions that aren't flexible become brittle and they can break. And we've seen that in a lot of countries where they don't have such 
strong conventions, therefore they do have very prescriptive constitutions and you do end up with problems um, where you end up in a position of unconstitutionality and you can't get yourself out of it. Uh, so as a general principle I'd say I um, think um, convention is preferable because it's flexible, but the one thing I'd go back to is what I said earlier on in the piece and I think perhaps if you have a mechanism by which members themselves by majority can bring back parliament during a prorogation, that would solve the problem without having to be any more prescriptive in relation to um, rules about prorogation. So that the government can prorogue as and when it wishes, but if a majority of the House wants to bring the, the um, parliament back early, it can petition the Speaker to do so. And just having that measure of flexibility um, would um, solve the problems without being overly prescriptive. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if there are legal limits on the power of prorogue, I think they should be legal limits that have been chosen by Parliament, having taken its time to think through what they should be, not legal limits that, uh, with respect to the court, are devised in an unclear and um, somewhat haphazard way in the, in the course of litigation. In addition, if, if the position is there was a convention that somehow was breached by this prorogation and the court has uh, taken over the convention with a new rule of law, I think that's problematic from, from a rule of law perspective not least since the Supreme Court told us very clearly a few years ago that uh, conventions are not enforceable, even if they're given statutory force and recognition, as the civil convention is in the Scotland Act. I should say in addition, I, obviously this was a wildly controversial prorogation, it's not clear to me that it breached constitutional convention. It might have been, uh, it was obviously politically controversial, it might have been politically irresponsible, especially in view of the Brexit timetable, which I think is the, the variable here. Uh, but. Um, the, the limits on, on constitutional prorogation think, are focused on abuse of confidence or abuse of uh, an absence of confidence. So trying to remain in office when you have lost confidence or doing your best to avoid ever losing it. That wasn't the situation here as I see it. So uh, it's not so obvious. I think this, this uh, understanding may be quite significant to the court's uh, position because it, it concludes there's a, a, a very serious problem here which it justifies uh, what is novel action. Professor If you need to. You don't have to. <laughs> I'll pull bear on this. Thank you so much. Do you, would you say that constitutional conventions more generally now need to be converted into statute? We've had a whole load of matters arising from this. The uh, instruction from Parliament to publish all the associated documents and communications was not complied with. The overreaching of special advisers, even this morning, giving these very sternly worded anonymous briefings and the sidelining of cabinet government, which is again a sacrosanct principle, I thought, of our constitution when I learnt it at school in A-level politics. Uh, for my part, uh, no, I don't think we should overhaul the constitutional convention at large. There may be particular instances where a convention has broken down or is unsatisfactory, and we do progressively introduce new rules of law uh, when conventions fail. Um, and I think the Fixed Term Parliament Act is something of a cautionary tale, um, and it's not replacing convention, but it's codification that gives rise to unpredictable consequences. And in a way, I think much of what we see now is arising because of that impasse, that we, uh, we have a state of affairs where it's very difficult to get the election that is needed to reset uh, the arrangements between the House of Parliament and, and Her Majesty's Government. Can I add to that? I, I think the Fixed Term Parliament Act is um, exactly the example of um, what you shouldn't do. Um, so um, uh, at least if you're going to do it, you need to do it a lot more carefully than it was done at the time. Um, my we only had one election actually on that timetable. Well, the, the first one this year, that would have been one every other year for me. The, the, the In problem my first with time that's not even finished yet. <laughs> The problem with the Act is I think it was, was dealing with a particular political situation at the time of a coalition government and wanting to ensure that the government continued for the full term. Um, there was insufficient consideration given to issues in it. Um, I, I actually made a submission to the House of Lords Committee at the time that was looking into it. In relation to things like, for example, prorogation, I pointed out that one of the key things you need to do when you have that kind of legislation, because we have the same in New South Wales, and I think the UK part, partly um, followed the New South Wales legislation, is you need to have a, a specific provision in there making sure that you can't prorogue in the 14-day period after a vote of no confidence. Um, that wasn't fixed. It does need to be fixed. Um, and I, I also said in that submission that you need to actually be clear about what can happen in that 14 days, whether or not the government can be changed and on what basis and what happens if you have a vote 
um, where the parliament says it has confidence in someone else. All those issues I raised back in 2010, whenever it was, when that legislation was going through, they weren't addressed. They're faults in that legislation. So my one plea is if you are going to try and put conventions into law, please do it a lot better. Think through the issues first, because that, that legislation is very poor and it does need fixing. Moving on, Ronnie Cullen. Well, that was my question, which is very good of you, because in this place, I mean, the, 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 this has all come about not because we've been prorogued, we've been prorogued all the time, we will be prorogued today, and nobody will bat an eyelid about it, but it's the length of time of, why we're, of, of the prorogation and therefore why we were prorogued, that, that's what's brought all this to the forefront. But in this committee, we continue to run up against conventions and principles, and the conventions are open to conjecture and some people don't have any principles. So what do we do in this situation to protect conventions and principles which we've said are so important? What can we actually do short of making of laws which we've said are sometimes too stringent and therefore cannot be interpreted? I'm looking at three of you because clearly we do not have any answers. Look, sometimes what's helpful is to try and um, explore and discuss, discuss and explain convention and how it should operate. And parliamentary committees have a really important role in that. So in looking at these issues in the past, I've looked back to um, reports of parliamentary committees on things like um, uh, constitutional reform. Um, I was looking at one recently about parliamentary privilege. Um, and the work of committees in exploring these issues, um, getting evidence, and um, considering what the conventions are um, is very important. In fact, I was also looking recently at, um, this is about the Article 9 stuff, which we'll come to, but looking at um, cases um, in the uh, UK Supreme Court where it referred to um, what a parliamentary committee was saying about parliamentary privilege. <coughs> so uh, I would, apart from anything else, encourage um, uh, parliamentary committees to explore the conventions and how they should operate. Um, because their reports in that regard are valuable and are even used by courts and others um, in developing and discussing those conventions. Uh, the other possible place for dealing with these things is the cabinet manual. Um, that's another form of dealing with things in a manner that's not binding, legally binding, and flexible, but uh, the other side of it, and the, and the face of incredulity um, suggests this, the other side of it, of course, is that the cabinet manual will always represent the views of the government of the day, um, not necessarily um, views that um, are consistent with um, constitutional principle that doesn't advantage the government. Um, so cabinet manuals are controversial in that way because they will always have a view of the world that gives extra power to governments that others won't necessarily um, do. But they do have the benefits of at least trying to set out basic principles in a way that remains flexible and not part of um, law. Um, yes, I only want to make a, a, a brief point in this regard, or two brief points. One is that, um, in general terms, I um, uh, agree with Professor Eakins in terms of saying that um, I, I have the same starting point, which is that I have no basis for believing that constitutional conventions should generally be converted into law. Uh, there's all sorts of good reasons why particularly some constitutional conventions would be wholly, would be uh, almost impossible to convert into meaningful legal rules and insofar as you could do so, the downside of doing so would far and exceed any benefit of doing so. So in that sense, we're, I, uh, I'm on, on the same page. The only other point I would want to make about the Fixed Term Parliament Act and matters of that kind is to distinguish between two points which I think are related but distinct. One is that, is the act a good act in itself? And I entirely accept that there, that there are deficiencies in the act. The related point, however, is do we think there should be some statutory controls on dissolution? And my own view on that is, yes, there should. I see absolutely no normative or political reason why it should simply be open to the government of the day, by virtue of being the government, that it can have an unfettered power to call an election whenever it wishes. That is not the norm in most other countries of the world, and I see no particular reason why it should be so here. I repeat, that doesn't mean the FTPA is perfect, it clearly is not. 
but that's a different point. Yep. Um, uh, Professor Rickards? I'll be brief. Um, I think political criticism is a powerful sanction uh, that supports convention. And it may be hard to see the, the fruits of it at times, but it, a, a breach of convention, especially if it's clear, I think is, is a reason to uh, invite and cultivate and, and um, uh, build up public opposition to a uh, course of action to a wider government program. Um, I mean, legislation, as we've said, there are reasons for caution. Uh, it's very true. Um, I mean, some narrowly cast legislation about prorogation might be uh, might avoid some of the risks of the fixed term Parliament Act. The fixed term Parliament Act going to the, you know, the heart of the relationship between government, uh, the House of Commons, the confidence principle, and um, easy to make a mess there, and a, a mess was made, I think. Uh, you could impose simply an upper limit on how long Parliament may be prorogued for. That might be quite clear and simple, and if the worry is, as the worry for the Supreme Court seems to be in part, uh, the, the sort of extreme hypothetical of, of very lengthy prorogation, which I think is you know, an unreal worry, but it's one people have, uh, you could deal with that by legislating to make prorogation for a, a certain period of time simply unlawful, as constitutions elsewhere do. Often it's quite a high level, you might want to make it lower. Or having the ability, as was pointed out by Professor Tomey earlier, to have the House of Commons vote to end the prorogation and bring everybody back. Uh, true, although then you might, there's a trade-off there, I think, between whether is it advantageous in the, the scheme of our, our uh, parliamentary government as it's developed across time to have uh, a crown power to um, uh, control the parliamentary time such that there is a fixed point of maybe 30 days or something that uh, can be without parliamentary discussion. That might be, in a historical perspective, that might be thought quite valuable. So when the fixed, when the fixed term parliament was been debated in 2010, maybe into 2011, the, <coughs> it was challenged then and there that the program of power still existed and the government's response, the response was that, uh, and as such, proposals to put prorogation on a statute footing were unwise and unnecessary. Were they wrong in saying that? Yes, no. I, I, know I think they, there was some good yes, sense no. in yes, saying no. that. No, okay. No. Uh, they weren't wrong in saying that. Yeah. They weren't wrong in saying that. It was wrong to say that. Professor Craig was saying yes. Maybe can I make it clear? Yes, no. Was, um, maybe let me do that. Uh, I think, it, as a standing matter, it is unwise uh, to to legislate um, uh, about this this matter. So I think it was there was good sense in their caution on that point. Um, in ordinary times, it would be unnecessary, but perhaps we're not in ordinary times. Can I just very Can I just finish this point? Is what we should be doing going back to fixed term Parliament Act and amending that Act to control aspects of prorogation so that it cannot be used as a political weapon? My one word answer would be yes. Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe. I'm maybe. tempted maybe. to say maybe. <laughs> maybe. Thank you very much. <laughs> But the important thing about the Fixed Term Parliament mm -hmm. Act is that it has completely changed the nature of our constitution, mm. it completely changes the relationship between the executive and parliament. Without sufficient thought. I think um, sufficient a lot more thought needs to be given in mm. to the dynamics of it and how it operates. Um, Marcus, very quickly. Yeah. So in that context, and in the context of what the judgment says about the Supreme Court's uh, willingness, e even obligation, uh, to uphold values and principles and make them effective and effectively to make judgments on political questions. Uh, should uh, the Supreme Court get involved in judging whether a Prime Minister is right to advise the Queen um, in convention as to who to call for to be the Prime Minister or in fact to not give such advice? Uh, well, I have to say that the point I'd make there is that the um, Prime Minister has no power to give binding advice to the Queen on who should be his or her successor. Um, although customarily, sometimes they are asked and give that advice, that advice is not constitutionally binding because the Prime Minister is no longer responsible to Parliament for that advice. Um, and that's why it's a reserve power of the monarch to um, choose whoever the Prime Minister is, but that reserve power is governed by the Convention that the person chosen is the person who is most likely to command the majority in the lower house. So I don't think in those circumstances that the Prime Minister has any power to give binding advice to the Queen.
Yes, I mean, sort of long before the judgment, even when it was being rumoured, and I think on the Sunday, the Observer had le- it was leaking all over the place, and it was being denied it would happen. We always knew that this would be politically controversial to have a prolonged uh, prorogation. Uh, so just, I mean, I wanted to ask really that it's a long-standing convention for the politicians and the civil service to keep the Queen out of it, keep the Queen out of politics, and not get sucked into, in the words of Lord Hayward, the late Lord Hayward, any sort of political controversy. Um, and that was words he said to our predecessor committee. To what extent do you think that this role and position of the sovereign in our constitutional arrangements has been undermined by this? I and mean, I imagine she is not amused. Question. You've already answered that question in an earlier answer, um, but maybe we can hear from the other two witnesses. I wouldn't have thought the position of the Queen had been undermined. I mean, her yeah. responsibility is to act on the advice of uh, her ministers who are accountable to the Houses of Parliament, especially the House of Commons. Uh, there is a reserve power, true, or at least arguably. And probably but when the party of law and order sort of has scant regard for the rule of law, then oh, well, does I, that put her in a very I, I deny the position. premise there, I'm afraid, because I, don't, I think if the conclusion, if, you, if you're arguing from the fact that the court held it to be unlawful, therefore the Prime Minister, when he set out or the government to advise the Queen, knew they were embarking on unlawful action. I think the court has, has retrospectively made the action unlawful in a way that was not predictable, even if it was a risk. Because the court, in my view, as we've discussed already, made new law and deciding to create new legal controls which it was devising on prorogation. So I don't, I'm, I can see why it's used as a ground for criticism, uh, but I think it's, it's wrong to say uh, the Prime Minister unlawfully advised the Queen and that somehow was a, uh, that, that's the wrong he committed. I mean it might be the prorogation is outrageous and it shouldn't have been done, etc. But it's not because of uh, sort of a decision to embroil the Majesty in unlawful conduct. I think that's a misleading frame of analysis uh, myself. I think it's necessary, I mean this is very delicate territory, but I think that it's necessary nonetheless to disaggregate two different um, senses in which there might have been some uh, impropriety. One is um, the, I agree, the very fact that a court decision after the event found that the prorogation was uh, unlawful does not in and of itself mean that the Prime Minister was wrong to go to the Queen in the terms that he did. I agree with Professor Eakins in that respect. There is, however, of course, and there has always been another dimension to this, and the other dimension to this is, and we don't know um, uh, because we weren't privy, um, we do not know precisely what advice the Prime Minister gave to the Queen as to the reasons for the prorogation when he went to see Her Majesty. I mean, apparently it had nothing to do with Brexit. That's what we all read, but nothing to do with that. It was for an exciting programme. Oh, well, um, well, exactly. So, but whether, just to press this then, um, uh, whether there would have been a duty incumbent upon the Prime Minister to make it clear that the period for which he was seeking a prorogation was very excessive in terms of the norm and that there wasn't, uh, whether he would need to explain to His uh, Majesty that notwithstanding that, he wished for the prorogation of that length for some other reason or for some reason which wasn't apparent on the face of it is, I think, a very delicate matter. Um, uh, But certainly it seems to me that any Prime Minister in advising the Queen would obviously have a duty of full disclosure. Um, Yes, but can I come back on that? Because it is relevant to my uh, point because there's a conflict between the convention that says that the advice to the Queen should be a matter between the Prime Minister and the Queen, for example, and the potential interference of the Supreme Court in demanding evidence of what that advice is in order to judge whether it was the right thing to do or not. How can the Supreme Court possibly get involved in such circumstances? Well, I I, I don't think think the the Supreme Court in its judgment does not arrogate to itself any power 
to ask for details of the conversation between the Prime Minister and Her Majesty. At no stage does, in the judgment do, does the Supreme Court do that. So I think we, all, we need to sort of dispel that. That's illusory. They did not do that. What they did was simply to ask the government, in the same way I've made the point already, Professor Twomey's made the point, they simply said to the government, this clearly is going to have a marked impact on the two constitutional principles of parliamentary sovereignty and accountability that we have identified. And it's particularly going to have that impact in given the circumstances of what is happening and the time period up until Brexit, until Halloween. So the court simply said to the government repeatedly, tell us what the reason is why we need a five-week prorogation. I repeat what I said earlier. That seems to me an absolute minimum of what is required in a liberal democracy for governmental justification of yes, its action. Yes, I was action. asking about other cases, not prorogation, but other executive... Well, so the Queen's speech, again, people are saying that the, a 93-year-old woman will be dragged into doing a party political broadcast for a very thinly veiled election that we've had every day of August campaigning for. So that's another example of how her role is being undermined for party political reasons. Well, well sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, two, two things here. Um, just for your interest, um, when these things happen in Australia, frequently the um, advice to the vice regal officer is in writing and is published. Um, so controversial prorogation in 2016, where the Turnbull government um, prorogued parliament, this time for the purposes of bringing parliament back. It didn't control the Senate, but it wanted the Senate to sit to, to discuss a controversial bill. So it prorogued, and because it was conscious of the fact that the Governor-General had a, a power to reject it, they set out in great detail in writing what the um, reasons for that were. Um, equally in Tasmania at the time of a controversial prorogation you had the advice in writing and it's the government that chooses then um, with the agreement of the vice regal officer to make that evidence public. So it might be in future that you do that in some kind of a formal way. Um, when it comes to the Queen's speech, by the way, she's not completely and utterly powerless in relation to what's included in it, because there was a marvellous circumstance in Australia where she was asked to read the speech from the throne when opening Parliament, and her um, a, a private secretary um, wrote back when, when seeing the draft of the speech, wrote back to the um, Australian government and said, um, well, for reasons of truth, I don't think we can say that. Um, and so they actually forced the Australian government to change the Queen's speech. How often she might do that in relation to the United Kingdom, who knows, but um, she's not completely powerless in relation to these things. Well, for reasons of um, truth, it can be a very short we, we we speech. Um, yeah. We're dropping a couple of questions which we think we've covered. We've got David Jones and then mm -hmm. Cheryl Gillan before we move to the next panel. I'm very grateful for the patience of the next panel. Um, uh, yes, uh, Professor Eakins, uh, before the judgment, uh, you argued uh, that um, prorogation was a proceeding in Parliament for the purposes of Article 9 of uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, that was uh, a point that was addressed directly uh, by uh, the court uh, in its judgment, and, uh, where it said, it's not a decision of either House of Parliament. Quite the contrary, it's something which is imposed on them uh, from outside. Um, can you uh, explain why uh, you contend that the use of a prerogative power to prorogue uh, is uh, a proceeding in Parliament? And perhaps you and the other members of the panel could explain the implications of the finding of the court that it, it was not. Uh, as it's um, traditional here, we're going to have different views across the panel. But uh, um, I, I took the view before the judgment it was a proceeding in Parliament and that even if the court were to find it was justiciable prorogation and even would find that it had um, acted unlawfully, uh, that nonetheless there was no remedy that could be given because Article 9 protects it. And I thought that because it seemed to me, uh, in a sense, the prorogation is obviously a proceeding in Parliament. It's literally carried out as such. It's recorded in the... Uh, the House's journals, it's understood as part of the proceedings, namely the part that being, brings the proceedings to a halt and makes provision for proceedings to begin again. Um, and I think, uh, with respect to the Supreme Court, uh, the account of uh, prorogation that's been done from outside by a foreign body, I think is a problematic frame. 
I think it's an act of the Crown in Parliament. Obviously, it's not an act of the Queen and Parliament, but the Crown participates in uh, the proceedings of Parliament, including by, uh, by way of prorogation for various other modes of um, uh, engagement as well. So I think to, to classify this as not a proceeding because the Crown is sort of an external body, I think was a mistake and uh, um, unpersuasive. Uh, and I think to, to, uh, to frame proceedings as though they must be decisions of the House, the House or the Houses, which they are able to sort of reverse, is to, um, uh, to adopt a sort of problematic understanding of proceeding. I think this, this was part of the way in which the House of Parliament uh, conducted themselves um, and how they brought their proceedings to an end, as you can tell by the, the, the official record kept, which has now been, as I understand, expunged and uh, retrospectively modified which I think suggests an interference with the proceeding in Parliament, to my mind. And the implications of the courts? Fine. I think the implications, well, could be, I mean, obviously, opening prorogation up to challenge, but uh, maybe in ordinary times that won't be so significant. Uh, Professor Toymey suggested um, the signification of royal assent might um, be open to challenge, or at least be more likely to be subject to litigation. Uh, dissolution, if the Fixed Term Parliament Act is, um, is modified. There could be various other acts of the Crown um, that bear on Parliament, uh, so possibly the signification of Queen's consent to or the giving of it or refusal of it in the, the course of um, the legislative process, uh, maybe a refusal simply to table legislation in the first place could be viewed as uh, somehow um, frustrating uh, an unexpressed wish of, of a majority in the House of Commons to legislate. I mean, these I'm not sure any of these will come to pass, but I think these are all arguable implications. I think it remains to be seen uh, how far the judgment stretches, if you like. In the opening paragraph of the judgment, as you, you may have noted, refers to this as a one-off. Mm -hmm. I think that's a problematic framing. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's going to be true, but it may suggest something about the disposition of the court, namely that in subsequent cases there might be an attempt to cabin some of these implications. And that partly turns on what lower courts do. Uh, what does the next divisional court um, do with this judgment in relation to these sorts of challenges? Professor Craig. Um, thank you. Um, it will come as a new surprise that on this I disagree with Professor Eakins. Um, <laughs> so let me just put the other side or the other view. I believe that the Supreme Court was correct in its determination of what constituted proceeding. I don't have time to go through the entirety of their arguments. Suffice to say that the reliance on the Chater ruling of the House of Lords I think was convincing and I think that their articulation of the meaning of the term was convincing. What I would like to add is simply this and I think it's reasonably important. It's the following. It's axiomatic in law that when we look at the text of a statutory provision we do so in the light of the statute as a whole and the purpose of the statute as a whole. Now, to state the obvious, the Bill of Rights 1688-1689 was passed for a number of reasons, the most important of which was to curtail unwarranted exercise of prerogative power. That is simply unarguable. And a number of the provisions in the 1688-1689 Bill of Rights speak to exactly that issue. No dispensing power, no suspending power, all of that kind of thing. So, if I might suggest the following, let us imagine we transport ourselves back and we're reconfigured as a committee in 1688, just after the Bill of Rights has been enacted. And we're rather proud to be in a parliament in circumstances where we believe that we have circumscribed unwarranted executive prerogative power. We are then told that Article 9 of the Bill of Rights enshrines protection against any use of the power of prorogation by the executive for any purposes whatsoever. So whereas we had thought we had enacted a statute, the terms and content and preface of which are all designed to curtail prerogative power, we then told that a provision which by its terms protects only proceedings by the collectivity as a whole 
or by individual members when they're exercising their speech rights, we are told that that provision is going to protect any exercise of executive prerogative power uh, in relation in uh, no matter what the circumstances are. That seems to me simply untenable as a matter of statutory interpretation if one takes the context, the letter, and the purpose of the statute as a whole. Um, first term. Can I just add that um, for the purposes of the committee, I've written an um, analysis of the various cases um, on the UK Constitutional Law Association's blog, which goes through the various cases, and um, I take the view that um, prorogation is not protected by Article 9, uh, simply because the um, Article 9 is not directed at protection of executive um, actions. But all the cases and the analysis is there for the, for the committee. What about your point about the Royal Assent? That, uh, uh, I think Royal that? Assent is different. Um, I've thought about this a lot since, um, and I think Royal Assent is different because Royal Assent can only occur after the two houses, or at least one of them, in, in, in all circumstances, have um, taken action to um, pass the bill. Um, and so royal assent is the Queen acting as part of the Parliament on the advice of the two houses, normally. Um, and that's different from prorogation because the houses get no choice in relation to prorogation. They don't get to approve it. They don't get to initiate it. It's not an action of the houses and their choice, whereas the passage of legislation is. Um, so I think from that point of view, royal assent is in a different category. Thank you. Um, Dame Cheryl. Um, finally, um, the court identified a second fundamental constitutional principle, that of parliamentary accountability, which we have actually touched on uh, a little bit before. Um, and there is a difference of opinion. I think some people are very sceptical about the use of, uh, of uh, parliamentary accountability as a legal principle, such as um, Stephen Tierney. Um, but if you go to Professor Mark Elliott, he's uh, suggested that the use made of parliamentary accountability was far less novel um, in this instance. I just wondered uh, what you felt um, the significance and implications of the court invoking this principle um, in the judgment uh, was. Um, should we start with Professor Eakins? Sure. I, I don't suppose we'll find a common view. <laughs> no, <very not. laughs> I was looking for you now. Yeah. I was so, well, you at this stage, but I, I mean, you I gave us a disagreement between Professors um, Tierney and Elliot, and I, I agree with Professor Tierney on this point. Yeah. Uh, uh, that this, um, this is a very surprising uh, judicialization of the principle of parliamentary accountability, uh, a principle that's a loose reference to a whole cluster of, of arrangements that go to the heart of our constitution, but are, are political arrangements, uh, conventional understandings and connections, political <coughs> dynamics. Uh, and the courts, have, from time to time, rightly take note of this. They might have to to understand uh, what's going on, um, but more often they, they take note of it to, to make sure they stay away from it. <laughs> uh, it's a reason for judicial caution and reticence uh, for not um, uh, displacing or um, undermining the integrity of the political constitution. And so I think it is a very surprising use here as a way to impose new restrictions on uh, on a power that otherwise one would have said the Lord did not, uh, not authorise restrictions. And in addition, I've said it before, but um, it is hard to square, I think, with this, the, that ringing statement uh, of principle in Miller number no. 1 that conventions are, are not for courts, even conventions given statutory recognition. I think the court was right then. That's wrong now. Professor Craig. Um, you won't be surprised as they take a different view. Um, in terms of the difference of view between Mark Elliott and Stephen Tierney, I go with Mark Elliott. <laughs> so um, th the reasons I do so twofold. One is that it seems to me simply wrong to imagine or to suggest that the notion of parliamentary accountability has no legal salience. It clearly does have legal salience for the reasons that Professor Eakins put on the table but then dismissed. It has legal salience because it affects the standard of judicial review. Now, if something affects the standard of judicial review, it's not affecting the standard of judicial review in some sort of interstitial, ancillary, minor way. It's actually shaping judicial review, and it's shaping judicial review in cases where the court thinks it's warranted, because it's saying there is parliamentary accountability, therefore we should re uh, desist from intervention in the way that we might otherwise have done. So it does have 
to, to suggest that it's completely a political idea or a constitutional convention with no legal normativity to it is, I think, just untenable. The, other, the second point I would make is that when Professor Ekin suggested that, well, there's a difference here. The courts, on when they've used parliamentary accountability, they used it to uh, hold back, and in this instance, they're using it to intervene. I think that's a short-sighted and mistaken conception of what's going on. In both instances, what is being protected and respected is Parliament. It's Parliament. In the classic cases where they show judicial restraint, what is being protected and respected is Parliament because the court averes that Parliament is exercising its review functions over topic X or topic Y, therefore the court should justifiably stand back. In this instance, what is happening is the court is also protecting Parliament. It's saying Parliament is being foreclosed from exercising the normal standard scrutiny and accountability role that it properly exercises in our constitution. And that when that happens in extremis, then that's a, a violation of a constitutional principle which the court can and should take cognizance of. Professor Twimmy, yes, is there a middle way? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was just going to tell you is this the Australian way. So um, that is that, um, first of all, the Australian courts have commonly recognised what we describe as the principle of responsible government um, as um, uh, in constitutional interpretation, statutory interpretation, etc. Um, and the other point is that um, uh, the Australian courts have also recognised that in developing the common law, um, you need to pay attention to constitutional principle. So what we're not talking about here, and I think the UK Supreme Court's taken the same point of view, it's not about um, turning convention into law, but what they are saying is that when the courts fulfil their normal role of developing the common law, they develop the common law in a manner that's consistent with constitutional principle, because it would be complete madness to develop the common law in a way that's inconsistent with your constitution. I mean, it's screamingly obvious that when you're interpreting the common law, you need to do so in a way that is consistent with the constitutional system under which you live. And that's really all that the Supreme Court is saying here, that in terms of working out the common law um, constraints on executive power, those common law constraints need to be interpreted in a manner that's consistent with your constitutional system and fundamental principles. And that is not unusual when it comes to Australian law. The High Court said the same thing in the Longy case in 1997, and we've been working on the same basis ever since. Thank you. Well, there are so many more things I would like to ask you about, but um, we must draw stumps. But thank you very, very much indeed for a most illuminating session if frustrating for all of us, but we couldn't say more. Thank you very much indeed, and can we have our next panel, please? So we go straight on, and can I ask each of our two witnesses to identify themselves for the record, please? Um, I'm Professor Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit at University College London. I'm Jonathan Sumption. I retired from the Supreme Court last December. I'm currently a visiting fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you both. And um, can I just make an initial observation before we come to our first scheduled question? which is, what is striking is that the judgment rests on a lot of case law, and particularly the case law around judicial review, which itself is, to some extent, um, invented law. It is not based on statutes. And even the case of proclamations um, is used in a way uh, uh, which, in a reverse way, this is because the case of proclamations was based on the property of not overturning statute. Um, and 
there is no statute to rest upon in this judgment. So we've come a long way. What, to what extent do you think um, and I, uh, the, 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 the judiciary is developing different juridical techniques, different understandings of its role, so that we actually have a different judiciary from what we had, say, before the 1960s and the invention of judicial review? Well, all common law is invented law in the sense in which you described it, sir. Um, but the function of developing the common law has been exercised by the courts ever since the 16th century and arguably earlier. Um, the short answer to your question are judges animated by different attitudes now than before the 60s uh, is yes, they are. Uh, they have um, exercised uh, a much more intrusive role uh, over uh, the control of government business. Uh, they have done that essentially because of the growing power of governments uh, and the um, growing importance, therefore, given the range of matters that governments deal with, of having some reserve system of control over what they do. Professor Russell? Um, well, I think um, by way of uh, disclaimer at the start, I should probably point out that I am the only non-lawyer that you are seeing today. <laughs> uh, I am not a court watcher, although I did find myself glued to um, sessions of the Supreme Court hearing in, in this case. I'm a Parliament watcher, and I think that's probably why I'm here. Um, but I think it's well known that there have been a series of changes which affect the role of the judiciary in our system, things like the Human Rights Act, etc. Um, and we might come on to Jonathan Sumption's claims in his Reith lectures about the, the rise of law and the decline of politics. And I think that we've, had, we've already had something of an interesting conversation about why that has happened. And I think it's not necessarily to do with judicial overreach. Partly it's to do with politicians actually stepping into the background on difficult decisions. And partly it's the behavior of civil society groups as well, who increasingly have taken to using the courts in order to get policy change that they're not succeeding in getting through the political process. So I don't think there's necessarily fault here, but the ground is clearly shifting. I'm, I'm not suggesting there's any fault. I'm <laughs> merely inviting an observation. Eleanor Smith. Uh, what do you think is a proper purpose or purposes for which prorogation can be used? Well, we heard this already to some extent on the previous panel. Um, the typical prorogation um, is a few days long, um, and it provides a dividing point between one session of Parliament and the next, or it provides a bit of breathing space before the dissolution for a general election. So that wasn't mentioned, I think, in the previous panel, but there are um, frequently there's frequently a short prorogation before the dissolution, um, not least to allow the timing to work out um, when you, in, given the statutory period from dissolution to an election, to make sure that the election happens on a Thursday. So those are the normal and perfectly proper uses of prorogation. We have, we, we know um, it's, been, it's been well covered that there have been various uses of prorogation that could be seen as being more political. One of the ones which, is, which interests me is the, the case in 1948 um, when there was a prorogation in order to bring on a short session in order to get a bill through that the House of Lords had been resisting. And as somebody who studied uh, the House of Lords, that's, that's of interest to me, not least because the bill in question was the Parliament Bill, which became the 1949 Parliament Act. People have argued that that was a political use of prorogation, but I think, and it, and it clearly was, but I think there is a big difference between that and some of the other cases that we've been discussing <coughs> earlier today, um, because that was actually a prorogation to facilitate what the House of Commons wanted to do, because the House of Commons had passed the Act and it was the House of Lords that was slowing it down. Um, so I think there, there's a distinction between cases where prorogation, and I think the Supreme Court made this distinction, where prorogation is to facilitate Parliament going about its ordinary business, and prorogation which is perhaps going to stymie the business of Parliament. I don't think, with respect, that the question that you've posed is capable of a definitive answer. It is easier to identify some things that are clearly outside the legitimate purposes of a prorogation. I am a strong believer in the value of non-legal conventions in our public life. 
uh, and I am skeptical of the value of judicial interventions, although I wholeheartedly approve of the most recent decision of the Supreme Court. The essential problem is that the Crown has enormous constitutional powers which are exercisable by ministers. The basis of that is that ministers command the confidence of the House of Commons, so the use of those powers by ministers of a minority government to suppress parliamentary criticism is a very serious abuse of our constitution. Uh, Parliament is an instrument of government in the sense that is not true of other non-Westminster style constitutions. The executive is part of Parliament. The House of Commons exists to criticise government, uh, uh, but also to support it or else change it uh, for another government which it can support. Obstruction of criticism uh, or, or obstruction of a motion of no confidence, in my view, seriously distorts the balance of our constitution. I might add, um, in, in agreement with some of the things that were said on the previous panel, there are, of course, questions as to whether prorogation is necessary at all. It is part of our system. Um, but um, we could move to a system of simply having five-year sessions between elections um, with recesses each year. There's not necessarily a need to prorogue, and this has been debated in our system from time to time. Um, it would make um, potentially the passage of legislation much easier if you didn't have uh, what Robin Cook, when he was leader of the House of Commons, used to refer to as the sessional cutoff that, that led to, as he used to say, a tidal wave of legislation arriving at the beginning of the session and then a rush to get it all through at the end of the session. We've obviously got carryover now, which does away with that a bit. We, there are ways in which we could rethink the whole system to make the flow of legislation easier across the whole length of a parliament. But that would have some significant implications. One of the biggest complications, ironically, would be with respect to the Parliament Act that I referred to before being um, pushed through in 1948-49. Um, because the Parliament Act, the powers of the House of Lords to delay are based on a bill having passed, been passed in two successive sessions. If you got rid of sessions, um, then you'd have to do something else. You'd have, to, you'd have to rewrite bits of the Parliament Act to constrain the powers of the House of Lords unless you wanted them to have a power of five years of delay. Um, but it's interesting that, for example, the Scottish Parliament um, just sits in one session between elections. It, it doesn't have, use this process that we do, and it's been referred to that it's, it's not um, universal overseas either. So we could look at the whole thing. Mm. So, um, so what do you think of the implications of the Supreme Court ruling for the continued use of power to prorogue Parliament, I mean, you've just said, and has the judgment clarified the existing rules or do we need to legislate or some changes which you've asked for, which you were just talking about in practice? I think on the first part of that I would defer to, to Lord Sumption, mm. um, but I mean, it seems to me that it is now clear that there are some constraints on the power of prorogation, but it's not clear where the limits are. Um, we could keep um, going back and forth you know, in a legal process and trying to work out where the limits are. My, my preferred approach would be to do something simpler and cleaner and say that um, like um, the power to dissolve for a general election or the power to adjourn for a recess, you give, assuming that you want to keep prorogation at all, you give the decision whether to, to whether to prorogue to Parliament. It might be a proposal from government, but it would need parliamentary approval. Or alternatively, I thought the suggestion from Professor Toomey was interesting, that the executive retains the power to prorogue, um, but that Parliament can petition the Speaker to be unprorogued. There would be an interesting parallel there with a recall from recess, because the inability of Parliament to bring itself back from recess has been controversial various times over recent years. And one of the ideas has been that MPs should be able to petition the Speaker to get a recall from recess. So I think if you were doing it for prorogation, you want to look at recess as well. But rather than arguing over the boundaries of it, I think the easiest thing to do is to give the ultimate decision to Parliament itself. And this would be done procedurally, not necessarily legislatively. I don't think so. No. Well, in answer to that last point, I don't think it can be done procedurally because uh, the, the royal prerogative is a question of law and the law would have to be changed uh, to uh, abolish it effectively. 
Um, if the law is to be changed, I think that has to be done by a statute. The simplest and cleanest way to do it, and I entirely agree with Professor Russell about this, would be to say uh, that um, the uh, uh, prorogation requires a resolution of the House of Commons. Mm. Um, but I, mean, I think there are, there are problems about the current state of the law post um, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, and, and you, you've essentially touched on them. There are two parts of the Supreme Court's reasoning. One of them uh, effectively says, this is not their language, but it's my summary, that it is intolerable that a government can disregard the conventions and simply leave a void in which governments are subject to no relevant control at all, apart from political control, which in a situation like the one we're in now would probably come too late. But there is a second aspect of this judgment which is much more problematical, namely the test which they have laid down for deciding when Parliament can be prorogued and when it can't. The test is that there must be a reasonable justification for doing it. Now, the Supreme Court didn't have to decide whether there was one in this case because the Prime Minister didn't put forward a justification. I think that was a serious misjudgment. Uh, but if ever the government does put forward a justification for reasons other than ordinary business management, the criteria for deciding whether that justification is reasonable will almost invariably be political. Suppose that the Prime Minister had said, I cannot be expected to negotiate with the EU uh, with all this noise going on in the background undermining my negotiating position. Now, people might or might not have agreed with that, but what is absolutely clear uh, is that the only criteria by which you could decide whether that was a good enough reason would be political. There are no legal criteria for deciding what is a sufficiently good political reason uh, justifying closing down Parliament. And that is why it seems to me very important that this, uh, that before we get another case of this kind, um, the decision should be handed back to Parliament in the form of a statutory requirement that there should be a notice. Now, although the, the Supreme Court said the circumstances will never arise again. Uh, I think one's got to treat that with some caution. <laughs> First of all, um, what is unexpected almost always does happen. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know which unexpected event is going to happen, something unexpected is going to happen. Secondly, there is a long history, not in this country on the whole, but in Australia and in Canada, of political prorogations. I think the consensus would be that the successive prorogations of the Canadian Parliament, in particular the prorogation by the Harper government in 2008 when it lost its majority as a result of the departure of one member of its coalition, um, I think most people would agree that that was an abuse uh, and that probably the Governor-General uh, ought not to have agreed to it. Um, but uh, it, it, it does seem to me that we have a, a system in which the, uh, the, the criteria, whether you agree with it or not, must be a matter for Parliament itself. You can't leave it entirely to the executive. I think it's undesirable in the interests of the court uh, and the constitutional integrity of our system that it should be decided by judges. It's got to be decided by Parliament. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to the argument that Parliament did decide, decide it by default, by failing to express an opinion on the matter, failing to um, remove the government because they didn't want prorogation. I mean, the, you know, the Im implication, if you leave a government in office with confidence, it has these powers and therefore it is, has the right to exercise these powers. Well, I find it very difficult to, uh, to <coughs> read that much into Parliament's inaction, bearing in mind that it reassembled on the 3rd of September for a very short period. Um, uh, the only thing that it could have done, I would have thought, uh, was it could have passed a resolution, but the present government and, the pre and Mrs May's government made it perfectly clear that they did not think that they would necessarily be bound by resolutions short of statutes. They could have passed a statute. Uh, I think that what they decided was that in the short time available it was better to concentrate on passing uh, the Ben Act. But I, I would be very cautious for drawing too many positive conclusions from the mere negative. I, if I could add to that, I, I thought it was rather 
disingenuous of the government lawyers to suggest that Parliament could have done something about this. I think it would have been very difficult for a number of reasons. I mean, in terms of when it should have done something, we've we've heard, you know, going back to the slightly longer history, uh, that there was an attempt to amend the Fixed Term Parliament's bill when it was going through Parliament, a proposal from Chris Bryant that prorogation ought to be limited. That was resisted by the government for reasons we, which might be obvious, I, I suppose, because this is. Uh, constraint on their powers, and they would always be inclined to resist uh, if, if they can. Um, before, um, uh, in the run-up to this um, announcement to prorogue, um, of course it was a very hot topic in the Conservative leadership contest. The chair has already referred to this um, and his own views on it and the advice that he gave to candidates, and several members of the Cabinet had indicated that um, they didn't think this would be the right way to act, and Boris Johnson himself had said that he was not attracted to it. So you could say that, in a sense, parliamentarians had been led to believe it wouldn't happen. And therefore, when it did happen, it was quite a shock. Um, and as Lord Sumption says, there were very few days when Parliament was sitting. I am told that there was discussion among some of the so-called rebel alliance on whether to put aside the Ben Bill and have a bill uh, to prevent prorogation. Um, but there were three obvious problems with that. One, they didn't have one ready because they hadn't been expecting this to happen. Two, if they had tried that and it had failed, they would have lost the only opportunity that they had to get the Ben bill through. And three, which is a rather finer point, um, it seemed very likely that any bill to limit prorogation, which as Lord Sumpson says, would be the only way of being sure to be able to constrain it because a resolution might not have been considered enough. Um, if there had been a bill attempting to constrain the prerogative, it would very likely have been judged to engage what's called Queen's consent, and therefore there would have been an executive veto uh, <laughs> on that bill. So it very likely would have failed, and the opportunity to pass the Ben bill would have been lost. The only other option they had, of course, uh, was to pass a vote of no confidence in the government in that time and replace it with a government which would have uh, asked for the prorogation um, to be reversed. But again, you've got a very short time period there, not only to have the vote of no confidence, but to get an alternative government. And if you didn't manage to do it within the time, you would have triggered the Fixed Term Parliament Act period, during which time, with Parliament prorogued, the Prime Minister would have been able to fix a general election date. And there were obviously fears that that general election date could be after the 31st of October. So I think that Parliament's hands really were tied. And I suspect, although I don't know, uh, because this would be the subject of their internal discussions, that this may have been one of the things that influenced the court, because it seemed perfectly clear to me. I doubt whether it influenced the court, but I agree with every word that Professor Russell says. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, moving on, um, um, Mark Fish. Um, thanks. Um, uh, some have said uh, that the, uh, the um, issue... Um, of ultravirus within the uh, judgment um, was something that um, uh, was in effect because, in effect, the executive in the UK has never, in fact, had the authority to prorogue Parliament. Now, I understand, Lord Sumption, that you might have a slightly different view. I wonder if you could explain um, where that opinion comes from and, and why you might take a different view. Well, ultravirus is a subject on which the courts have got into a terrible muddle because they have never been able to make up their mind on any very satisfactory criteria whether it means uh, that the government or whether the decision maker simply lacks the power to do it at all so that the attempt to do it is just a non-event or whether it's another word for abusing a power that unquestionably does exist. The word ultravarious has been used to describe both things, although they are obviously conceptually completely different. So uh, without seeking to uh, evade your question, I think that life would be simpler and clearer if we didn't use that particular expression. Um, I mean, the, the decision undoubtedly was that it was unlawful, um, and that was a decision which was radical in its reasoning uh, but very conservative in its result. And I agree with what Professor Craig has told you earlier today, that this didn't simply uh, come out of a clear blue sky. 
the exercise of the royal prerogative by ministers has been reviewable uh, for 25 years since 1984, the decision in the GCHQ case. Uh, the, uh, the, the law has always uh, been careful uh, that there are very few, if any, unlimited powers. The classic statement uh, is that of Lord Diplock in, uh, in a slightly earlier case where he said that ministers are responsible uh, to the courts for the legality of their decision and to Parliament alone for their policies and the efficiency with which they carried it out. But the courts have never accepted at any time that ministers can be responsible to absolutely nobody for what they do. Uh, and the problem about this prorogation was that it created a period of five weeks when there would have been effective responsibility for nobody and retrospective political sanctions of the kind suggested as appropriate by Professor Eakins would in all probability have come too late. Uh, so, so what are the implications for our understanding of executive power when it comes to other types of things? I was. Um, uh, we were discussing earlier the idea of uh, the advice to the Queen on, on who to send for, that, that, that is convention, it isn't strictly an executive power, i.e. it is the reserve power of the sovereign, but it clearly is analogous um, from one point of view. Uh, what, what are the implications? Is, is anything reviewable? I, I don't think that you can assume that the reasoning behind the decision on prorogation uh, it can be transposed to that or many other contexts. I mean, prorogation is in some ways a, a very self-contained and slightly eccentric island of the law. And the uh, reason of the Supreme Court is very specifically directed to prorogation. I cannot see the court uh, interfering in the process by which the Queen decides who to send for. And I think that although uh, famously uh, Mr. Macmillan did tender very forthright advice to the Queen about his own successor, I think that the correct view is actually that the Queen is not bound by his advice in circumstances where he's an outgoing minister. But the point that you raise does, I think, raise one very, very significant question, broader question. Um, we have a hereditary head of state um, we have no constitutional referee uh, in areas which are not necessarily covered by law because the Queen, by constitutional convention, is required to accept that the advice of her ministers. The result is that the monarch is incapable of performing the function of referee of last resort on constitutional issues, which is performed by nearly every other non-executive head of state in the world. Uh, now, one understands that her very delicate position as a hereditary monarch is the justification for that. But, for example, uh, in the Netherlands, where they also have a hereditary monarchy, uh, the Queen takes uh, an active but not a personal role in the formation of governments by appointing a commissioner uh, uh, whose job it is uh, to negotiate with the various interested parties until uh, a consensus can be found to support a particular government. And I think that it is important that in the longer term that we should devise a system which enables the powers of the monarchy to be exercised and which uh, frees the monarch from the uh, exclusive dependence on the advice often self-interested that ministers give her. My own view about this, which I have expressed earlier, is that um, the Privy Council is the, institutional, um, the, is the institution through which the royal prerogative is exercised. I think that there should be a constitutional committee of the Privy Council, which would have some lawyers, but a minority of lawyers, um, uh, which would be charged with giving the, the monarch independent advice on the constitutional propriety of things she is being asked to do by ministers, uh, especially in areas which really are governed by convention and not by law. I think, could I, could I just add, I, I think these are very interesting ideas, but I wanted to come back to your, your question from um, a couple of angles. I mean, firstly, I think it was established on the previous panel, and I don't know whether we'll come on and talk more about this later, 
um, that on the matter of appointing the Prime Minister, the Queen genuinely does act as a long stop. She does have discretion on that if a Prime Minister has lost the confidence of Parliament. So I don't think the courts are needed as a long stop on that particular thing. With respect to whether we're entering now some kind of free-for-all, where all government powers are up for judicial review, etc., um, I think, as the, as the court said, um, it's already been referred to, they saw this judgment as a one-off. And I think, um, as Lord Sumption has referred to prorogation as being, a, I think, a funny little island. The, the, the point was that at the very core of this case was the question of the place where the courts usually ought to kick things that might be seen not as their business, uh, not being available to have the matter kicked to it, because where the courts are usually criticised or can be criticised for meddling in things which are political and not their business are matters on which Parliament, as the sovereign body in our constitution, ought to be deciding. But this was one thing that the courts could not refer to Parliament, because Parliament clearly did not have the power to unprorogue itself. So I think in that respect, this is a one-off. It was precisely about the sovereign body in our constitution, the head of the political constitution, being shut down, and therefore the legal bit of the constitution having to step in to resurrect it. So I'm not sure that it is um, you know, the start of something new. I think it might be, as the court says, a one-off. But having said that, of course, I'm not a court watcher and I'm not a lawyer. Can I, just, I, I broadly agree with that. So. Can, can I just ask one or two supplementaries? Presumably, Her Majesty does privately take legal advice um, if she thought she was being asked to do something illegal, she would want to have that conversation, albeit privately, with the Prime Minister about it, on the basis of that advice. I'm not sure that that's so. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do not know from the inside. I would think that the Queen was certainly entitled to ask the Prime Minister uh, for, to lay before her the view of the Attorney General. But I think there would be serious problems about her taking legal advice outside the framework of government altogether. Okay. And I'm not aware of any occasion when she has sought to do so. But, but, but it, your mechanism is basically recommending that she should be able to do that from this special constitutional committee of the Privy Council? Yes, so that wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't simply exclusively be legal advice. I mean, I would envisage a, a committee of the Privy Council which would comprise elder statesmen with a minority of, uh, of legal members. And, um, and secondly, uh, we're discussing, of course, what the Sovereign's discretion is in the event that the Prime Minister has tendered his resignation, or her resignation. Um, in the 14-day period, there has been a suggestion that the Prime Minister would not seek to facilitate um, the handover to a, um, an alternative administration um, and on the basis of his belief that there would not be um, a government he could recommend to, her, to the sovereign that would actually command confidence. Um, uh, would the this court be minded to intervene in that in that in, in that process if, if the, the sitting prime minister was seen to be frustrating the handover to a um, a different administration by it, refusing to resign? Essentially, I think it's it shouldn't be seen as the job of the prime minister to choose the next Prime Minister. It is essentially, and this is, I mean, we may get into talking about minority government later. I think a lot of these things get confused in a context of minority government, which we're not very used to. It is fundamentally the position of Parliament to recommend, if you like, to the Prime Minister, um, who to, to the Queen, who ought to be appointed as an alternative Prime Minister. One of the difficulties with the Fixed Term Parliament Act is that it doesn't set out any specific mechanism for Parliament to do that. And I think you know, that's another gap which might need to be filled. But I think that the reason for that gap is that under normal circumstances, um, probably what was envisaged when the Act was written was that you're talking about something like a coalition government where one of the coalition partners decides to depart and join with the official opposition to form an alternative majority. You have reliable voting blocks within the House of Commons. It's fairly clear, therefore, who the Queen ought to be appointing as an alternative Prime Minister. The difficulty in this Parliament, which is bringing all this to the fore, is that it's so fragmented, there's so much division within the major parties and so many little groups and people acting as independents that it's not clear where the majority would come from. But ultimately, I think, in terms of the 14-day period, it is for Parliament to signal in some way 
um, if we get into that situation, um, to the Queen, who ought to be appointed as an alternative, who would enjoy the confidence. And there are various ways that you can imagine doing that. It could be anything from an early day motion, it could even be a letter, it could be a vote on the floor of some kind to request maybe a humble address, to request that the Queen appoint a certain person. I think it's a mistake to see it as the Prime Minister's job to say who that should well, be. Well, the Cabinet Manual describes it as the Prime Minister's job in order to insulate the Sovereign from political controversy that, that the, uh, the Prime Minister must recommend to the, uh, the, the Sovereign the name of a successor who is likely to command the confidence of the House of Commons. My question is different which is supposing the Prime Minister just doesn't want to do that because he wants a general election. And so he doesn't resign. The, the assumption behind the 14-day provisions of the Fixed-Term Parliament Act it seems to be uh, that the Prime Minister will resign um, if it becomes clear that somebody else commands the confidence of the House. The problem about the Act is that the second resolution that the House does have confidence in Her Majesty's government assumes that by then there is another government in place in which it has confidence, but without describing how that government is to come into existence. Um, my own view is that the Prime Minister is entitled uh, uh, to squat in uh, uh, Number 10 Downing Street until it does become apparent and a loyal address might be one way of doing it, that there is an alternative government that would command a majority and that he is then bound to resign. My reason for thinking that is simply that the Fixed Term Parliament Act simply can't work in any other way. And, and the court, court, was, the would, court have to would be likely that. to enforce that if he squatted? Well, they would, because a, a statute is by definition justiciable mm -hmm. in, if, in all its respects. So the courts would have to decide what those provisions, the 14-day provisions, meant. And they will not simply confine themselves to woodenly reading the language. They will say, in order that this can work, it must have been intended that this or that should happen. You, you mentioned the Cabinet Manual. As it happens, I have taken a little fragment from paragraph 2.19 2 of the Cabinet Manual. Please don't test me on any others. This is the only quotation I've got. Uh, but it says, the Prime Minister is expected to resign where it is clear that he or she does not have the confidence of the House of Commons and that an alternative government does have the confidence. So the comment in the Sunday Times this weekend from supposedly a senior Cabinet Minister that there is nothing in the Fixed Term Parliament Act that says you have to resign. The Queen is not going to fire the Prime Minister. She would dissolve Parliament and let the people decide. I think is a, well, is a statement in contravention of the Cabinet Manual. I think the Cabinet Manual describes what should happen. Well, the Cabinet Manual describes what should happen, but it's also correct that there is nothing in law. Of course, the Cabinet Manual and isn't law, yeah. but, but I'm, not sure what the, I'm not sure what you would but say. But what Lord Sumption is saying, we might well find that there, that there is a law. I think it's, it's a correct statement of what the Fixed Term Parliament Act 14-day provisions must mean if they are to be workable at all. And I don't, I'm not sure whether the Queen would be guided by the Cabinet Manual. Well, the problem really is that I think that the Queen will wish to avoid any kind of intervention at all. It is true that in theory, as Professor Russell rightly says, the Queen does have a discretion in the formation of government. but. Frankly, I think that in current conditions she would uh, do almost anything to avoid exercising that discretion. <laughs> Somebody else has got to do it. So we've got to amend the Fixed Term Parliament Act to make it clear how that's going to happen. Right. We must move on. Ms. Huck. Uh, Dr. Huck. Dr. Huck. I have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a professor like everyone else is. But I'm not um, a professor either. <laughs> good, that makes two of us. The Supreme Court found that the government didn't present any reason, let alone a good reason, for proroguing for this prolonged prorogation of five weeks. So they didn't actually judge whether the government had reasonable justification. So that sort of appears to hint that we might be opening the door at future reasonable justification assessments. Um, do you think those might become more commonplace? Well. Uh, this, I think, takes one back to the discussion that we, we had earlier. Um, I, I, I think that we do have a problem because I don't think that one can assume that political prorogations are a thing of the past. Uh, what I think we can assume is that because of the Supreme Court judgment, any government that wishes to engage in a political prorogation will put forward a large number of uh, 
supposedly plausible reasons for doing it. And the court will then have to decide, one, whether those are the true reasons, uh, and two, uh, whether they are a reasonable justification. Now, I have serious misgivings uh, about courts engaging in that exercise, which is why I think this, this decision should be returned to Parliament by way of a, a, a motion in the House of Commons. Ah, right. And so if, they, if this government had the thumping big majority it craves, none of this would apply? Well, I think it may well happen again. Uh, I mean, after all, there have been at least five political prorogations in the history of Canada, all but one of which are within the last half century. So, you know, this is not uh, a, 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 a completely extraordinary event, and I think that we must expect that, not necessarily soon, but sometime, we will have to face this problem again. We should be forearmed. No, I mean, I agree with that. It goes back to what we were saying before about um, replacing the, pror the prorogation power operating as it does now with one that gives the power to Parliament. I mean, I think it is... I don't want to be... Jonathan's maybe being a bit gloomy in saying that these things will happen again, but, of course, it is, it is the case that once a, once a taboo has been broken, um, habits can form. The, the court has squashed this particular prorogation, but if people wanted to start gaming the system in future... Um, playing around with shorter lengths of time and some re reasons which might or might not be considered inadequate, maybe they could do so. And it might be better just to knock the whole thing on the head and say that the House of Commons must decide whether it wants to be prorogued as it decides whether it wants to be uh, adjourned or dissolved. I mean, do you, do you see um, a possibility of this reasonable justification assessment being performed by courts? You'd rather it was Parliament, but could you foresee that? <coughs> Well, I, I, I think it is undesirable it, uh, that uh, a, a decision which in almost all cases is going to be decided on purely political criteria should be made by the courts. I think it's undesirable on objective constitutional grounds, and I think it would undermine the independence of the courts in a way that is uh, undesirable in a, more, in a much broader sense. Um, I, I think that Professor Craig was right to say to you an hour or so ago, uh, that in exercising this power to decide whether the justification was reasonable, the courts would give a generous margin of discretion to the Prime Minister. But that in itself can be problematical. Suppose that one must expect his generous margin of discretion to be exercised in his own political interest, um, and suppose that Parliament took a different view. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that the answer is to allow the courts to decide uh, something which is as broad as that, because that just aggravates the problem arising from the political nature of the question. Mm. You know, it's worth going back again to say those words, minority government. I mean, you know, these kinds of tensions at times of majority party government or even majority coalition government, if you have a stable coalition, are very unlikely to occur. Um, but, you know, maybe we need to fix some of these things in anticipation of a future minority government or unstable government situation. Most of the time we wouldn't need the provisions and it would be a pure formality that the House of Commons voted because it would vote in line with what the government wanted because the government and the, and the majority in the House of Commons are in agreement with each other. I mean, may, I think we may well be heading for a period when there will be more minority governments or more coalition governments mm -hmm and when the stability that we've taken for granted for many years, up to recently, um, will, will, will disappear. Mm, yeah, no, all the polls are predicting we might have a government with a third of the vote or even Indeed. less. Um, does the reasoning used for justice, the, the ability, <laughs> open the possibility of using a prerogative power in a new or extended way that impinges a constitutional principle or some other law, so long as reasonable justification can be provided? Well, as I've said, and, and as I think Professor Russell has also said, um, I, I think that this judgment doesn't open up that possibility because it's, uh, it, it's concerned with a specific and a rather special sort of power exercised in a most unusual situation. After all, major changes, political changes, such as that which will follow from our departure from the EU, normally happen by... Uh, positive decision. Uh, the 
what a lot of the problems in this area have arisen recently because a major change is liable to happen by virtue of nothing happening by the relevant cutoff date. Um, and so there's a premium on inaction. Now, this is a combination of circumstances that I can't imagine arising very often. And any other safeguards you would recommend, if not? What, on prorogation? Well, the, I mean, there is Professor Toomey's uh, idea that you can unprorogue yourself by vote of Parliament. I have to say, I find that rather clumsy. I think it's much cleaner and neater and administratively easier for Parliament to decide whether it wants to be prorogued or not. Mr. Carr. In some places, there would appear to be going to be where there are going to be minority governments and coalitions, and yet this place is completely inadequate working in that sort of setup. So we're going to have to learn how to work together across party to actually achieve anything, or it's going to be a downward spiral. But looking at the judgment of the Supreme Court, it made it clear that prorogation, in this case five out of eight weeks, leading up to a major constitutional change in leaving the European Union, impinges on the fundamental constitutional principles of Parliament, sovereignty and Parliament accountability. So what are the implications of the, the weight given by the court to these principles for how we understand the UK's constitutional arrangements? Um, well, I have said that at one, uh, at one level um, this judgment can be seen as a kind of earthquake, but at another level it can be seen as absolutely obvious. Um, I've referred to it as politics 101 um, because it's very surprising to see a situation where the courts have had to step in in this way um, and that the Prime Minister has been found to have acted unlawfully um, on such a sensitive issue as the, uh, the advice that he gave to the Queen and to see the court resurrecting Parliament is a pretty extraordinary thing. But the principles that they advocated, that they um, articulated in the judgment, were absolutely uncontroversial central principles. And I say British Politics 101 because they're literally in the first class that I teach my British politics students. That um, the British Constitution is characterised um, by uh, parliamentary sovereignty, um, parliament being the highest authority. Um, and the fact that the government is accountable to Parliament and ultimately um, in extremists can be removed by Parliament. And what the court did was emphasise um, those principles as the underpinning reasons for its judgment and in doing so I think just stated some very obvious things um, about the way that the system works which I hope will help people in future to um, understand the system better. If there was anything very unusual about what went on here, I think it was the fact that the government acted in the way that it did, requiring the court to respond in the way that it did. Um, I had a look um, at what some of the other commentators have said, and a lot of them agreed with the sort of thing that I uh, said in terms of this being both extraordinary and um, mundane. Um, Professor Shona Douglas Scott from Queen Mary said that it was a remarkable ru ruling, but an orthodox one. Uh, Professor Mark Elliott um, from Cambridge um, said it was rooted both in orthodoxy and it was path-breaking. Um, and Professor Mike Gordon from Liverpool University suggested, and I think this is a key point, uh, that the ruling may not even be the most significant constitutional event this month. <laughs> and I think probably what he was referring to there was the actions of the government, but there have been quite a lot of big constitutional things going on, so I'm not quite sure what he had in mind. <laughs> The contrary view, which I don't share, but it's, it's, I mention it because I think it, it comes close to what, what you're concerned about, is the one expressed by uh, Professor Eakins, which uh, I think can be fairly summarised in this way. He says, OK, Parliament is sovereign, but a, and that's a proposition of law. Uh, there is no source of law higher than parliamentary legislation. Uh, but accountability, he would say, uh, is not a proposition of law. It's a mere political fact. Now, uh, Professor Craig uh, uh, had uh, some very critical words to say about that theory, and I agree with all of them. Uh, it, it seems to me that parliamentary accountability is the whole basis 
uh, on which the courts draw lines as to what decisions they may inter interfere with and which decisions they can't. It's also an essential underpinning of the separation of powers because it enables the courts to distinguish between those matters in respect of which ministers are responsible to the courts and those in which they're uh, responsible to Parliament. I think parliamentary accountability is a very familiar concept in law and it is simply nonsense to say that it has no existence except as a political fact. And it was, of course, a factor. I'm not saying that this was a factor in the court's judgment, but I mean, I, I commented, um, as many of you may have seen, when the prorogation happened on what was extraordinary about the prorogation, not only that it was the longest prorogation uh, for 90 years, but that it came at a time when uh, the Prime Minister had been in office while Parliament was sitting for only one day, um, and Parliament had just been subject to a five-week recess in the run-up to a deadline to make a very serious decision um, by the end of October. Um, so, the, the, and within that, within this, across the summer, there had been, of course, a lot of debate um, in, in the media about the potential of a no confidence vote in the government. So, it seems to me that shutting down Parliament at a time when there was this deadline, and also there was at the very least a question as to whether the government's confidence was going to be maintained, was very problematic. And so, and that was in contravention with the principle of government accountability to Parliament and the fundamental which I referred to, that ultimately Parliament can remove the government from office. So it scrutinises the government, it holds the government to account for its actions, and if it is not satisfied with what the government is doing, ultimately it can remove the government. But it cannot do any of that if it is prorogued. Um, um, Mr Hopkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, my first question was supposed to going to be to Professor Russell. You've anticipated that in your quotes I've got written down here, which is very interesting. So I'll go into the raw assumption, if I may. Um, in your Reef lectures, you've raised concerns about the expanding empire of law, as you put it, and the decline of politics. To what extent do you think the Supreme Court's judgment on prorogation is a continuation of these trends? Um, well, um, the reason for objecting, as uh, I do, to the extent to which the courts have uh, intervened in what I would classify as political matters, is that it undermines the legitimacy of democratic decision making. Mm. Uh, this judgment, I don't think, does have that effect. There is a world of difference between the courts arrogating to themselves a power which politically ought to belong to ministers responsible to Parliament, on the one hand, and the courts simply saying, as they have done in their recent decision, this is a matter on which Parliament must be enabled to make decisions. The difference is fundamental. Um, just talk, talking about the, the Fixed Term Parliament Act, I mean, it occurs to me very simply, if you want Parliament to make a decision, we could have had a general election, had there not been the the two-thirds majority required from the House. I mean, if the government had said we want it as 50, 50 cent plus one, we, we would have had a general election. Isn't the, in the end, handing the power back to the people to make a decision in a general election, that would be the solution, surely? Well, the problem political one too. was correctly identified, I think, by Professor Craig when he considered this area, which is that, in principle, uh, to hand to the executive uh, an, an unfettered discretion as to the timing of an election so that they can um, use it to their own electoral advantage gives them a, wep a weapon which can be used manipulatively and historically quite often has been used manipulatively uh, to get a popular endorsement which you know, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have got at any other time. Um, so the principle of the Fixed Term Parliament Act seems to me to be wholly acceptable. What is problematical about it is the detailed mechanics, and in particular the mechanics of the 14-day uh, period of grace, which has not been properly thought through and has had the ironic effect of uh, allowing ministers to stay in power longer than they would have done under the previous system. And I think, again, um, the deadline, the looming deadline at the end of October is absolutely crucial here. I mean, it, it was relevant to the 
to the difficulties of the timing of the prorogation. And I suggested earlier in the in the summer, even of the even of the recess, um, given the need to scrutinise the negotiations and scrutinise the no deal planning and so on. But it has also got tangled up with the operation of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, I think, where perhaps if the deadline had not been hanging over us, perhaps Parliament, perhaps the House of Commons would have voted for a general election. But there's this fear of wasting time between now and the deadline and potentially having a general election period which even spans the deadline. So I think that we're in a very peculiar period of politics here where we have the, the decision of the referendum hanging over us, we have the deadline, we have minority government, and this is creating a very kind of unhappy, almost purgatorial situation uh, where we need to get beyond the 31st of October and do our best to put politics back on its feet, I think. Mr. Fish. Um, do you think that uh, this, um, this arguable um, uh, entry into the world of politics in one sense of this judgment means that it will extend into uh, reviewing the government's ability to make treaties? No. Okay. Uh, governments, uh, uh, I, I don't think that anybody is going to uh, uh, limit the government's power uh, to make treaties any more than they are already limited. The government cannot, by making treaties, alter the law of England um, or of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm glad you slipped that in. Yes, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, it needs a statute to do that, so Parliament does get a look in there. The only areas where the, uh, where the government can make treaties free of parliamentary interference um, is uh, where the treaty has no impact on the internal law of the United Kingdom, for example, a, a, a pure treaty uh, of, of, of political alliance. There, even in that context, there is, of course, a convention which has always been observed since the 1920s when it was first formulated, the Ponsonby Convention, under which treaties are laid before ratification, before, uh, before both houses of parliament. Yeah, um, and um, I was uh, one of the intriguing things about the judgment was that it was supported at eleven to zero, in my view. And as, as a lay person reading the judgment, it seemed to me to be highly unlikely that, given some of the language in it. Um, which was arguably kind of straying into the florid at times, words like ex extreme would seem to me um, in the context of the extreme effect on the fundamentals of our democracy to have potentially been a point of contention and I would be extremely surprised if 11 in incredibly distinguished jurists would, uh, would have agreed on such language. I'm just interested in your view as to how it could possibly have come about that 11 such people could have agreed to use such language? Well, I sat in the Supreme Court for seven years, uh, and I have to say uh, that the court includes a large number of people whose arms are very untwistable. Yeah. So I do, exactly. not, I do not buy the theory which I've heard from many quarters uh, that there must have been uh, some, some uh, draconian manipulation or some uh, 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 command that people should jolly well get into line. Uh, I suspect that the reason why uh, they uh, steered well clear of the question what the government's reasons really were and whether they were reasonably justifiable is that if they had entered upon that territory, there would not have been unanimity. I mean, it seems to me perfectly legitimate for a court to avoid an issue on which they are not agreed uh, in order to decide the case on a ground on which they are. And I think that's probably what happened. I have no inside knowledge, I should say. Could I just add something related quickly? If it's quick. Yep. Um, I just wondered what you made of the Attorney General's suggestion in the statement last week that we should replace these Supreme Court judges with a more American-style political appointee oh. version. That suggestion was... Assumes... Nicking somebody else's question. Oh, no. Is it... <laughs> I didn't think it was on there. No? <laughs> I haven't seen it on there. That's why I added it. Okay, sorry. 
that suggestion assumes uh, that the political views uh, of judges influence uh, their decisions on questions like this. In a confirmation hearing, how would you satisfy yourself that you were going to get judges that were or weren't going to reach the sort of conclusion that the Supreme Court did in this case? Would you ask them whether they believed in Brexit or whether they were Remainers? Uh, or, 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 I mean, it is, to my mind, confirmation hearings are uh, uh, one uh, constitutionally inappropriate uh, because they undermine the ju judiciary by associating them with political positions, and two, useless, as they have been for many years in the United States, where ev every ever since Robert Bork's confirmation hearings in the late 70s, there's been a complete perfect routine for these confirmation hearings. Whenever you're asked as a candidate whether you would, uh, how you would decide a particular case, you say I would have to listen to all the submissions of either side before coming to a view, so I decline to say. And it, that's the right answer, and it's an answer which leads nowhere. A better solution is to make sure that the judges aren't compelled to take political decisions. Uh, I think that's true. Um, Some of the American ones turned out to be unexpectedly liberal when they were appointed as Conservatives. Oh, yes. The moment you let judges out of um, your um, sight, they engage in <laughs> untutored thinking. Um, David Jones. Uh, yes, Lord, Lord Sumption. Um, after the Supreme Court judgment, you wrote an article in the Times in which you said that political conventions are a better, more flexible and more democratic alternative to law. But if we are to avoid a wholly legal constitution, we must honour them. And then you uh, referred later in the article to what you described as the constitutional vandalism of the uh, Prime Minister, uh, and went on to say that the natural result of that was that conventions have hardened into law. That's the effect of the Supreme Court's uh, decision. And you, want, you went on to say that that was very regrettable. Yes. Um, do you believe that this judgment has generally protected or, or will act as a protection to conventions in the future? Well, I hope so, because I hope uh, that uh, ministers and others uh, will learn uh, that if they uh, deliberately play fast and loose with conventions on which our system is founded, uh, they will end up uh, with a much harder set of rules, which I think would be very unfortunate. They would be less flexible, they would involve more judicial intervention, uh, and uh, I think it is a thousand pities that the government put itself in a position where the Supreme Court had to do what it did. And this lack of flexibility is why you refer to the outcome of the judgment as being infinitely regrettable, I think. Yes. I mean, you... Uh, Legal rules tend to be rules which shut stable doors after the horse has bolted. Um, and uh, they then have to be applied uh, to all the uh, jumpy horses that are in the stables next door uh, with results that are often very unpredictable. Um, I think that it's a less satisfactory way of dealing with these matters. I mean, our constitution as Walter Badgett said 150 years ago, is famously flexible. Uh, that has been a tremendous advantage. It has enabled this country uh, to retain the basic constitutional frame, same basic constitutional framework for 300 years of very radical change. There is no other constitution in the world, even the Constitution of the United States, that has survived it unchanged in its essential respects because capable of adapting to new challenges with quite, to quite the degree that the British Constitution has. And I, don't, I think that that is something that we should welcome and value. What more can be done to protect uh, conventions or do you think anything further needs to be done? Do you just hope that the government will learn from this experience? It's a question of shared political culture. Mm -hmm. If you destroy the shared political culture then nothing can be done. Uh, and I very much hope that one lesson that people will learn from this is that they should respect the political culture. The, um, uh, the ends do not always justify the means. I think it's very, very 
difficult. I mean, our, our system clearly rests more on convention than many other systems do, and that requires people to um, respect the conventions and use, use the flexibility where it's appropriate, um, but, not, but not to abuse the conventions and the traditions, and not to see um, the law as the only constraint upon them. But all um, constitutions d depend to some degree on convention, and they all depend on people behaving reasonably and respecting the rules and traditions. I mean, if you go back to the point that we were talking about before, about the potential of a prime minister refusing to leave Downing Street if an alternative prime minister could command the confidence of the House of Commons, I mean, that is, that, that's not a problem which comes just from the conventional nature of our constitution. It's tantamount to um, a president of the United States refusing to leave the White House if an alternative president had been elected. And I think it's equally difficult to deal with in both systems. I mean, if you, if you take it down to the, the level of ordinary people, it's like having an eviction notice served on you and refusing to leave your house. And if you get to the stage where you're needing bailiffs and policemen and the National Guard to remove people, you have a society or you have a political system which basically is not functioning. We cannot function in that way. But if you're going to have a system where Parliament can impose laws on the government that are contrary to its policy, um, all sorts of things are going to go wrong. Um, in the United States, the President has a veto power. Yeah. Uh, this is not how our separation of powers operates, because it assumes the, that the, that the government controls Parliament. I think this takes us back, though, to the point of, of minority government. I mean, it is, it is the, you know, the politics 101 that I referred to before, which I think has been reinforced by the court case, is that the senior partner in the British system is Parliament, not government. The government only is the government because it has the confidence of Parliament, and it relies on Parliament to get its legislation through. So if Parliament legislates contrary to the will of the government, that in itself is not a revolutionary act. But what would you do, what, 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 may, if I may, if I may yeah, what do you do where you have a House of Commons that will wound but not kill? Hmm. Because hmm. in reality, we know that this government doesn't really enjoy much confidence from this House of Commons, hmm. but they haven't got the guts to deal with it. Well, that's the purgatory that I was referring to, and I think the answer ultimately is get beyond the 31st of October, because we are in this but peculiar, but unique situation. Wait, wait, wait. But my um, other point is that the very legitimacy of Parliament is undermined if you have a Speaker who is not acting by convention and is uh, not honouring the conventions that are there within our Constitution. It's a fundamental of our Constitution that the Speaker is unbiased and that is arguably not the case in this instance and that is affecting Parliament but so, so do you think for example that it is time to review the Bill of Rights to, to, to see whether uh, proceedings of Parliament <coughs> in certain circumstances can be reviewable by the Supreme Court just as, as it is the last bulwark against abuses of other parts of our convention how can that not be a valid uh, a area for review as well? No, I don't. And on, on the speaker, I would say that um, obviously we're in very, very delicate water here. There's lots of controversy going on. But the speaker, I think, he would see himself as trying to facilitate the majority in Parliament. And the speaker is subject to a very similar mechanism to the Prime Minister. If the House of Commons doesn't have confidence in the speaker, it can remove him. Um, that is his accountability. Also, it didn't have to uh, to vote to uh, take away the uh, um, government's um, control of the order paper as it did in May and again in September. There was a parliamentary majority for that. But only by reinterpreting standing orders. Well, uh, I think that the interpretation of SO24 was very questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, but the earlier um, uh, the earlier ruling allowing um, MPs to take control of the order paper was based not on a, on a standing order but on precedent and there I think that the practice of Parliament must depend on what no, there was Parliament no, does. There was no precedent of that, well, the, on, on the, the precedent was that, the, that uh, you could not amend the business motion. So the precedent was wholly in favour of the government.
and it is perfectly true that the Speaker, with the support of a majority of Parliament, departed from that President. Well, uh, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that any practice of Parliament can be like the laws of the Medes and Persians and incapable of, of alteration even with the consent of majority of Parliament. I certainly think that in the case of SO24, uh, it may well be that the proper approach would have been to amend the SO rather than uh, simply to drive a coach and horses through it. Uh, but you know that, that's not a problem that arose in May. In the words of Humpty Dumpty come to mind. <laughs> Um, it's something you said, uh, totally the opposition parties, not having the guts to deal with this, I would interpret that as not being prepared to walk into a giant elephant trap, when the time is right, we will deal with this government. I accept that, but the House of Commons did have the option of having a general election before the 31st of October. Yeah, that's, but you need to disentangle that, that, these that, That's the elephant trap we're talking about. Yeah. That's what you can walk out of the EU with no deal. No, no, if, if the election had taken place, well, I'm not looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, Shell, go. Um, the gist of most of my questions um, just in this section have really been, been taken by colleagues. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, do you really think that um, that opening statement from the court is, is true, that this is going to be a one-off decision of the Supreme Court? Um, and do you think that when the Supreme Court was uh, put in position, um, that this activity was envisaged to fall within its ambit? Well, if I may answer the first of your questions, I don't think one can count on this being a one-off because even in the context of prorogation, there's too much of a history of it in other jurisdictions for one to be able to say that. As to the status of the Supreme Court, I think there's a lot of misconception about this. Um, the, um, the Supreme Court is simply the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords under another name and in another place and with a much larger budget. That's, that's the only change. The powers are the same, the procedures are the same, the habits of thought are the same. There is nothing that the Supreme Court has done which the Judicial Committee wouldn't have done before 2009. You know, I'm inclined to think this almost is a one-off. And, I mean, in terms of the claiming that we're, 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 any claims that we're moving to a situation where we're ruled by judges rather than ruled by Parliament, I think, would, is, is, is quite wrong. I mean, our constitution, see, for example, our constitution again, retains its, its, its unique character that we do not have a written document which has um, a status above ordinary law, that Parliament can make or unmake laws. The point in this case was simply that, and in, in, and in those cases, the judges, the, the judges adjudicate um, and, and the legislature is weaker. We do not have that system. We have a system where Parliament remains sovereign, but Parliament cannot act if Parliament has been prorogued. And I think that is the unique nature of this case. It may not be entirely unique if, as Lord Sumption suggests, we have other arguments about prorogation, and the way to prevent that is to solve prorogation, as we referred to before, by handing that power to Parliament. Um, I, I sit on the Council of Europe for the UK and, of course, have the responsibility of voting for the judges there. And uh, Lord Sumption, you raised concerns about the, uh, the, the role of the European Court of Human Rights um, because it was inventing, in, in your view, uh, additional rights um, that are really quite contentious and, and far from being fundamental. But uh, do you see that any of the factors um, that we have developing in our own legal system here might lead to a UK court making decisions that have that consequence of inventing uh, rights and laws? Well, there is, as I've said, a, a very radical difference between uh, the courts intervening to preserve the powers and autonomy of Parliament and the courts intervening uh, to decide for itself quote, matters that, on a traditional view, should be decided by ministers answerable to Parliament. But uh, if, if I think that your question is really getting at, do, are there signs that the UK courts may be uh, uh, taking over the, the mission creep which has affected the Strasbourg court for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, to which my answer is yes, there are not only signs of that, but it has in fact been doing so uh, for a, a good two and a half decades, if not longer. Uh, I explained in my wreath lectures why I thought that that was not consistent 
with a democratic constitution, the same in respect of a very limited class of core rights, certainly a much more limited class than the British courts and the Strasbourg court have classified uh, as justiciable rights. Thank you. So I share your concern. So to what extent is sovereignty of parliament now justiciable? Um, well, that is a, a, a hotly debated question. My own view is that the sovereignty of Parliament is not justiciable, it's not up for grabs. There are people who have suggested otherwise, both, I mean, judges, both in judgments and in uh, extrajudicial statements. Uh, personally, I, I deplore that. It seems to me that in an unwritten constitution, we have only one sheet anchor and that is the sovereignty of Parliament. If you depart from that, you create what is amounts to an unamendable constitution, which is wholly outside the control uh, of anybody responsible ultimately to the electorate. Uh, I do not think that can possibly be justified. I think that on this, uh, the late Tom Bingham got it absolutely right in his book on the rule of law. Uh, and I deplore suggestions to the opposite effect. Um, and by the sovereignty of Parliament, you mean in the Dicean sense that Parliament has the power to make or unmake any law? Exactly. Yeah. And indeed, that proposition was clearly reaffirmed in Miller No. 1, and reaffirmed by reference to the statement of Dicey itself. Um, sorry, uh, just a, a stray spider, if they're all the rage these days, uh, the spider lettuce case, which seemed to overturn, overturn the in the Evans case, seem to overturn the um, provision of the Freedom of Information Act that explicitly allowed the Attorney General to apply an exemption um, to the Freedom of Information Act, which the court appeared to overturn. Yes. Wasn't that the court overturning statute? Yes. I mean, I discussed this case in one of my wreath lectures. In my view, it was a wholly impermissible act. But, uh, it, was an, it, was, it depended on the interpretation uh, of the relevant statute, uh, but the Freedom of Information Act on this point, it's not clear on all points, but on this point it seemed to me to be abundantly clear, uh, and I, I fear that the Supreme Court, and indeed the Court of Appeal before it, essentially took the view that they did because they disapproved of what Parliament had unquestionably done. And what should we do about that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, one solution, I suppose, would be to reinstate the thing in, in language which was even more emphatic. But ultimately, if judges are not prepared to respect the meaning of Acts of Parliament, there is very little um, that can be done about it. I very much hope that such a thing does not happen again. The courts have traditionally been super sensitive about any attempt to control the exercise of their own powers or displace their power of intervention. I think the courts ought to get used to the idea that there are some issues on which a minister answerable to Parliament may be a better judge of the public interest than a judge. Is it a small step towards the consideration of electing judges as we do in Strasbourg? Well, the, the Strasbourg system is essentially a, 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 a vetting system rather than, I mean, the, the judge is nominated by the home government and the council on which you sit uh, decides whether they're suitable. It has to be said that some of them have been remarkably unsuitable over the years. <laughs> not, well, there are not, I have countries. to say, from this jurisdiction. <laughs> do, you, do, do you see it as a small step towards... Um, an American, a more American style system? Well, I hope not. I mean, the, the, the problem is that, uh, that there is no European or Council of Europe system uh, for nominating judges. It depends on the practice uh, in the various um, member states of the Council of Europe. I mean, the starting point in this country, by comparison, is very different. We now have a non-political commission which nominates judges after taking extensive consultations, not uh, from ministers. Um, and so we start from a situation uh, where the factors that make, that make it necessary for the Council of Europe to have a vetting committee just don't exist. But if the courts think, continue <laughs> down that path, it, it starts to, to get more tempting. 
Well, I mean, I can see that you could extrapolate the practice of the Council of Europe and apply it in England. I hope that that won't happen, and I don't think that the fact that the Council of Europe does it in rather different circumstances is likely to make it more likely here. I would love to do an inquiry into how judges are appointed, but I fear <laughs> that might extend beyond the immediate remit of this committee. It might. So we will draw stumps there. Uh, but can I thank you both very, very much indeed uh, for a very, very interesting session.